Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Rachel and recently I decided to ask the question, what's been going on with Girl Defined? Turns out, quite a lot. Now, it's been a while since we last checked in with Kristen and Bethany in their search for biblical womanhood or girlhood as they like to call it um, here on my channel. So today we're going to be diving back into that hellscape for a little bit of light torture and hopefully to learn something along the way. One thing I will say is I started out this video being very snarky when I was writing my script and at the end I, I didn't have a change of heart but I definitely learned some stuff and came to some surprising conclusions so I invite you to come on this journey with me and you might be a little bit shocked by the end of it. Now, when Girl Defined first started their channel, they were clearly targeting teenage girls and very young women. I mean, even their channel name suggests this, Girl Defined, not, you know, woman defined. In the early days of their channel, they wrote a lot about their teen crushes, how when they were younger, they wanted to be models and that whole experience. And of course, what it was like to still be a virgin at 29 years old. And over the years, they continued this trend with videos such as advice for teenage Christian girls on staying strong in your faith. So I feel like this is kind of looking back like, hey teens, I know what it's like. <laughs> I was just there. It's hard to be a Christian, to be a teen. How to find joy and contentment as a single girl. Hey girls, it's Bethany. And today I want to talk to you about a topic that is super relevant to me. And I'm guessing is super relevant to many of you as well. It's the topic of singleness being single, not having a boyfriend, not having a guy that likes you, just being you with no guy around. And that is me in life. I am totally single. And the classic, what cow tipping taught us about living beyond the moment. So several years ago, actually back in high school, Kristen and I decided to do something absolutely crazy. We had always heard of the term cow tipping and we honestly thought <laughs> it was a real thing. And of course, in the middle of COVID, they decided to put on a huge in-person conference featuring coloring tables full of children, which was a choice. But over the years, these girls have had to grow up and realize that they can't stay girls forever. They have to become women. Kristen has now adopted two children who she is preventing from speaking their native language and traumatizing them by dragging them into videos and on stage at every opportunity and making them pretend they don't hate what's happening to them. Meanwhile, Bethany herself also got married and popped out two babies of her own and never misses an opportunity to repost her wedding photos for the 3,000th time that month. And when she's not doing that, she's busy holding her baby like a prop to remind us, hey, I finally have a girl. Today on The Girl Defined Show, we are talking about OnlyFans. The average, so that means there are people who make more, obviously, and people who make even less than that. Creators, so if you're a creator on there, typically they charge anywhere from $750 to $75 for a monthly subscription, which means that you need between three and 30 subscribers to earn only $220. And I know that might seem like a lot, like, oh, that's so easy. I mean, I have like thousands of subscribers on Instagram. How hard can it be? Now, Bethany's a really interesting character because after redefining herself first as a business guru and an online course maker, because apparently that's a thing, she's now decided most recently to define her new identity as a sex expert, which is interesting considering the fact that her new sex-centered course is coming out around the same time as her husband has come out saying that he has been miserable for their entire marriage. Oh, and now he's being very honest about the fact that they've been having terrible, terrible sex. Now, normally I wouldn't comment on someone's personal life to this extent, but it's really interesting because from the moment she got married, Bethany has made it a very big point to always talk about her personal life, her sex life, her relationship, her wedding, her marriage, her marriage. She's made her relationship her brand. Everything she's done has become about this marriage. She's always been very much like, I've done relationships the right way. I've done marriage the right way. And now my marriage is perfect. My relationship is perfect. I'm having the best sex ever because I did it the godly way, the right way. No one else is as happy as I am unless you do it my way too. However, with these revelations from Dave speaking publicly, it's interesting because it seems like she's having to do a little bit of reassessment herself. And for once, we might actually be seeing a little bit of growth in Bethany. We might actually be seeing the real her and not this fake positive front that she puts on, you know? So today we're going to be going right back to the beginning of Girl Defined and looking at some of the earliest videos in which Bethany spoke about her relationship and wedding and 
her own sexual experiences essentially and coming right up to the present day and seeing what's changed and why. On October 14th, 2018, former single girl and abstinence advocate Bethany Baird got married. Don't believe me? Well, she was worried millions wouldn't, so she decided to live stream the entire event on the Girl Defined YouTube channel for their 200 and odd thousand subscribers. Over 200,000 people tuned in to ask themselves questions such as, what the hell am I watching? And why am I wasting my life like this? As we saw Bethany and Dave get married in a far too long ceremony that just went on and on and on and on. Wow, welcome to our wedding. Do you remember what you wore? now able to brag to the world that not only was her first ever kiss with her husband at 30 years old after she was married, but now it was archived on the internet forever. Now, don't worry if you missed that clip at all. She does repost the photos and videos of it on Instagram every 10 days. So you will see it again soon, don't worry. Immediately after getting married, Bethany had her priorities straight. She just had to inform the entire internet that she was having sex now. She was doing the sex. The sex was being done to her because she was a real grown up at last. And she did the sexy sex. You know all the stuff she was saying before about, you know, loving being a single girl, being content with doing God's will, blah blah blah, she didn't really need a man if it wasn't God's will. Well, screw it, no, all that went out the window. She finally had a man who wanted her. She was a married woman and doing the sex. And she just had to make sure we all knew it. Less than a month after her wedding, Kristen and Bethany posted the video. Bethany talks wedding, honeymoon and marriage, thus letting the world know that she wasn't gonna let a little thing like the concept of a private life interfere with her telling everyone what was finally happening inside her vagina. As most of you know, I got married about three and a half weeks Woo! ago, so this is my first vlog back since being married, since becoming Mrs. Beale. So how did you, yes. before you got married, mentally like make that switch from yeah. not being intimate with Dave, not living with Dave, to now having all of those things? Yeah. You know what's really interesting, I mean you know this, but we, the two of us, wrote a book called sex purity and the longings of a girl's heart during the, it was during the process of me being in a relationship and getting engaged so i yeah. had the awesome privilege really of getting to study god's design for sex purity just all of that our sexuality like dig into it and really study it because we were writing a book about it and that actually releases in april of 2019 but i think Ooh. that was really helpful because i was yeah. able to gain such a biblical perspective and really kind of like debunk any false ideas that i had like oh sex is bad or oh you know it's gross or awkward instead it's like wow this is god's amazing design and intimacy within marriage is such a beautiful thing in the right context now this here was a super interesting moment because here bethany acknowledges that up until a few months ago before she actually got married, she still had these preconceptions that sex was gross and awkward. And how did she learn she was wrong about this? By doing research to write a book teaching people about sex. Very bizarre. Now, this is one of the few Girl Defined books that I haven't actually reviewed yet on my channel. It's the next one on the list to review. I've reviewed their first books very in depth in a whole series if you want to go watch them. But the fact that she was like, I still think sex is gross and icky, but I'm gonna write a book about how to have it, is odd to me. Also, let's take note here that what she's talking about here is the direct result of purity culture. It, it just is. This feeling of shame and guilt and disgust around sex, a lack of understanding about what sex actually is and what it involves, a fear of it because it's unknown and taboo and you've been told it'll make you very dirty and wrong and a sinner and you'll go to hell unless you do it in these very specific set of circumstances. 
that is what purity culture does and it's damaging and that's something we're going to be exploring a lot more in this video and interestingly Bethany explores it a lot too and it seems she's finally starting to question it a little bit which is honestly a positive. Now Bethany isn't the only one who goes on to end up questioning purity culture. Many other Christians today and people who've left the religion as well but many people are calling out purity culture for the damage it does. I've spoken about it a hell of a lot on this video but it's also great to hear from people who are still believers which I obviously am not um, but who can recognize the damage that purity culture does. So for example Diana E. Anderson writes in her book Damaged Goods a generation of Christian women and men, girls and boys, is hurting and broken from the sexual dysfunction and shame of purity culture. Many grew up being told over and over that their virginity was the most important thing they could give their spouse on their wedding night, only to reach that point and realize that having saved themselves didn't magically create sexual compatibility or solve their marital issues. Many soon divorced. Still, others sat silently in their church groups wondering what virginity could possibly mean for them as people who had been victims of incest or abuse or who felt attracted to the same gender. Now it's interesting because this is something that we'll see over the next few years up until today. Bethany actually goes through herself. The questioning of like, well I've saved myself, why isn't there this magical connection? It's very interesting to see a victim of purity culture who has then gone on to push purity culture on others to promote purity culture, almost deconstructing it in real time and thinking, crap, this has damaged me. And now Girl Defined is starting to actually call out purity culture a little bit. Not as much as we would like, but it's interesting. But we'll talk about that when we get to it. Another example is uh, Rachel Joy Welcher, who reflects in her book, Talking Back to Purity Culture. I was in high school when Joshua Harris's book, I Kissed Dating Goodbye captured the attention of the evangelical world. It kicked off a movement and inspired countless other books on dating and sexual purity. I read many of these, internalizing messages about my responsibility as a female to keep men from lusting, the value of my virginity, and how sexual sin could destroy my future marriage. I often finished these books more ashamed of my sexuality than when I'd started them. Marriage and sex were placed on a pedestal and they quickly became an idol something I thought would one day complete me. Later on she writes, the books I had read promised that premarital purity would result in a flourishing marriage. They told me that sexual obedience would secure a specific blessing. When the reward didn't come, I was left to wonder what I had done wrong. Now Bethany and Kristen at this point have been pr pushing and promoting purity culture for years, even if they didn't label it as such. Bethany had clearly, before her wedding, internalized these messages and the damage it had caused to this point where she felt incredibly gross at the prospect of sex at all. And as we'll learn later, she didn't actually learn what sex was until a very, very late age, but we'll discuss that when she decides to reveal it herself. In this YouTube video that she talks about like the lead up to her wedding, she claims that she began to see sex as not gross, but only in the confines of marriage. So she replaced one set of externally enforced restrictions with another. It's progress, but also it's still quite damaging. She then in the video goes on to talk about expectations that her and Dave apparently had for the wedding night. Yes. So now that you have experienced a honeymoon, how was it for y'all? Ooh, honeymoons. <laughs> I actually loved our honeymoon and I think that's because of the intentionality of getting advice, getting wisdom and talking to a lot of different people beforehand, getting those mixed reviews, but then realizing <laughs> like, oh, we can do a lot with our mindsets and the choices that we make going into our honeymoon. So if I had the mindset like, this is going to be the best of my life, he better make me completely happy, right. I probably would have been pretty Your expectations are like yeah. 100%. Because because yeah. he's just human, I'm just human, and he can't satisfy me in a way that only God can. But I think because we went into it knowing like only God can satisfy us, we were able to just enjoy the moment. We didn't have like an expectation like we want to accomplish this or do this or experience this. It was mm -hmm. just like, wow, we just want to enjoy being together, learn about each other, and there's no pressure or expectation for either of us. And so I think because of that, we had an awesome time. Well now on the surface, this seems really great. All her stuff about just enjoying each other seems lovely. Um, how excited she was about their honeymoon, that seems great, brilliant, but then listen again. What she's saying is that their expectations for their wedding night for each other were so low, it couldn't really be bad because the bar was already on the floor. Like I say, there's some positive aspects in this of like just wanting to enjoy each other and stuff, not having high expectations, but on the other hand, it still sounds like she was sort of expecting failure and kind of got it, you know? 
listen more because even though at this point she's still trying to portray this oh my god my marriage is so perfect my wedding is so perfect doing things my way is so perfect we actually start to see the cracks appearing really early on this is just weeks after the wedding and the cracks are already showing oh, you know it's crazy because i I always kind of imagined marriage that I would almost like turn into this different person. I'd be like, fascinating marriage. You, you know? are Mrs. Beale. I am Mrs. Beale. That's a little different. You keep commenting like, oh, you're like the same person, you know? And it's crazy. Now we're husband and wife and we're lovers and we love each other and everything that goes in with that. But like, I'm the same person and he's the same person. And I just feel like we're becoming better versions of ourselves, mm. you know? So I'm a sinner, he's a sinner. So it's not like I don't have selfish moments. I for sure do and he does. And it's, you have to work through that. But if you're expecting to have a perfect marriage, it'd be a disappointment. But if you're expecting to have like, I get to work through this with mm. him, then it's amazing. So, so far, three and a half weeks in, <laughs> we're doing pretty good. So <laughs> you have all these expectations. So it was in that moment that you realize mm. like, you're still human, you're still a sinner, you still have these sinful desires. And my natural tendency is to start, I start getting frustrated at him. Like I have to be so intentional to, to really like, guard my thoughts because my thoughts affect my emotions directly and I've realized like it's really hard you know because you're with this person all the time they don't just like you I leave and I'm like bye and I right. see you next day so if I'm mad at you I can kind of like okay give it have a, day, a little you know? break but it's like if a day I feel frustrated at him or he feels frustrated at me you you know even at the end of the day you're together and you have to work through it and so there's no escaping <laughs> conflict and I think that is a challenge to really act Christ-like and be loving even in those moments when it can feel a little difficult. Now it could be argued that this is what happens when you don't really get to know a person before you marry them. It is this funny thing of going from zero to a hundred just overnight. You don't really get to spend extended periods of time with someone. You don't live with someone before marriage. You don't spend whole days and nights together before marriage when you don't see someone at their highs and their lows and everything in between and now all of a sudden you're essentially trapped with them. You know, it does make things difficult. This is why I think it's so important to have these prolonged periods of time together before you make a big legal, bind, legally binding commitment like that. It's why it's so important to make sure you can live together and get on and all that stuff before you marry someone. But what do I know, you know, I'm just, just a dirty sinner. Fast forward to March 2019 and Kristen and Bethany decided to invite their husbands onto their channel to have an honest conversation about saving sex for marriage. Let's look at some clips. The reality is freedom can only be experienced within proper constraints. Like I can say that from the core of the core of my waited, 30 years. Right, you waited yeah. a long time. Yeah. 30 years to kiss or have sex or any of that really. And I think, wow, what a beautiful moment. Like the anticipation is so beautiful and the waiting is so beautiful. Instead of viewing that as negative, like, wow, look at all those years and now look who I get to experience this. And I can tell you there's nothing sweeter than saying, wow, I'm going to wait to share this with the man who has committed everything to me. We're entering into a covenant and he has chosen to give up everything else and to love me exclusively for the rest of his life. Like that's the most romantic thing in the world, you know? And Absolutely, and I've, I mean, Yes, absolutely worth it. it. I've experienced, we've experienced so much value yeah. in, in our sexual relationship that um, that's really, especially as time goes on, even though we've only been married for several months, yeah. yeah. As time goes on, I'm finding that there is a sweetness that is actually growing. Yeah. And that mm -hmm. lines up with, mm -hmm. you know, neurological research. The more sex you have with one person, the more connected sex you're having with one person, the more your brain gets tied and starts to associate sex with that person. So sex outside of marriage, um, before the promise, before the covenant, yeah. is going to be totally different sex. Now I really want you to listen in particular to what Dave said here about the reality is freedom can only be experienced within proper constraints. Take note of that and then compare it to what he says in his most recent live stream about how he actually looks back on this period of time and how he actually felt during it. Very, very interesting. I won't say much on this for now, but just keep it in mind for later on, yeah? In 2019, Bethany and Dave announced that they were pregnant in the most obnoxious way possible during Kristen's ongoing fertility issues and repeated miscarriages. Because for the first time in our lives, one plus one makes for the first time in our lives, we're having a baby. <laughs> what do you think? I have no idea. <laughs> It'll be us. But 
hey, you do you, I guess. She's not my sister. This was quickly followed up by the video Baby Boy and Pregnancy Updates on the main Girl Defined channel where the top comment was literally Congratulations! Please be gentle on your sister throughout your pregnancy. Infertility is so hard! Which is ironic since Kristen had recently shared how hard infertility was for her and how long she'd been trying for a baby. Meanwhile, Bethany and Dave were a year into marriage and telling us this. Like, like you said, it's like we weren't trying, like we weren't tracking things and trying to get pregnant, but we weren't not, not, like we weren't not trying. We were just kind of living. We were so <laughs> chill. We were so chill, but in a really cool way. Yeah, it was really good for us and just like yeah. gave us a lot of peace and rest, just knowing whatever would happen would happen. And we just kind of trusted that to God. And so, yeah. so we were married for what, seven months before? Uh, uh, yeah, I something guess so. like that. Yeah, something like that. Compare this to the video that Kristen put out not very long after with her husband Zach, where they told us about their infertility journey, and it was literally the opposite of Bethany's experience. So as you guys know, we got married in 2011, and we were open to having kids from day one. We were actually really excited about the prospect, and and that was kind of the plan, right? I mean, we were planning <laughs> on this. It wasn't, it was kind of one of those things like, hey, okay, this is what happens when you get married yeah. and you're not preventing and that's gonna come, that's gonna come along. As year one rolled into year two, that's when I started really getting concerned. Like, okay, this is really abnormal, it seems. You know, like, why aren't we getting pregnant? And then literally after our second anniversary, we got married in the summer, second anniversary, I got pregnant. And then six and a half weeks into that pregnancy, I miscarried. And that completely blindsided us. Hmm. Neither of us were expecting that. We were not even thinking that was an option, like that could even happen to us. And so that was super, super hard. And I know during that time, we were both wrestling with just asking that question, like, why God? You know, why would we wait? Why would you not give us kids for two years and then give us a kid and then take it from us? And we were really, really wrestling just with those questions and struggling in our hearts. This is a difficult one for me to talk about because Obviously, I've not really experienced what it's like to be either one of them. I'm a woman who doesn't want kids, so I don't understand the struggle of infertility, and I don't understand the joy of being pregnant when you want to be. I just know the joy of not being pregnant when you don't want to be. Um, so I can't really comment from either side, but for me, it does just feel a little insensitive, and while I understand that Bethany was clearly excited and happy and you know, wanted to share this joy with everyone else, I can't help but feel like she was being a bit insensitive of her sister. I know for me, if my sister was going through something like that, I wouldn't be rubbing it in her face, you know? Moving forward into 2020, and in January, Bethany and Dave decided to make a video together answering their viewers' questions about marriage, sex, the first time, and becoming parents. And it actually opens in a pretty cute way, I'll be honest. Action. Is this good? Oh, yeah, okay. Oh, oh, okay. Come on. For those of you who are new around here, here's a little history. Uh, we got married about 15 months ago, yes. and one thing led to another, and we're having a baby. She's having a baby, and I'm helping. I'm reading a book called The Birth Partner, and this is how I'm preparing to uh, uh, get ready to, for the birth. Dave and Bethany actually seem happy together. They actually seem to enjoy each other's company, which is something we hadn't really seen a lot of before this point. It all seemed very fake and forced before. This seems like a genuine moment. It's quite sweet, you know? There is definitely a change in his behavior as his first questions asked, though. Um, he goes from joking around, silly voices, making jokes, said that twice, but he goes from that to visibly getting slightly more uncomfortable when the first question immediately asks him about his sexual experiences. And I just kind of get the impression that, you know, I think it's one thing to talk about your own experiences online with a lot of people, but when you're talking about an experience you share with someone else, I can see why that would make them uncomfortable, you know? I do have to wonder how much he has actually been okay with Bethany talking so much about this stuff online, sharing so many personal details and stuff, and there's one podcast she does an interview on later where I have to ask, was Dave okay with this? It's, yeah. Let's start out with something really, really, really important. Yeah. Was Dave nervous about his first time? Oh, snap. And I assume first time. It's a... It is capitalized. You're talking about relations. The first time we had damn relations. <laughs> People actually ask about this a lot. Were you nervous? Was it awkward? 
Actually, I did write a blog on this. I'll link to it below. What did you say in the blog, just so that I don't contradict us? I didn't. I didn't. I said it wasn't awkward. It wasn't awkward. And I, I said the anticipation is like it definitely beautiful. wasn't awkward, and I wasn't nervous. I don't think I was nervous. I feel like most guys aren't nervous. Yeah. I feel like it's more of a girl thing. Oh, are you nervous? No, I mean, I feel like it's more common. Girls are asking that question. I wonder if it's like if guys, okay. like if there were like a guy blog or guys would be nervous yeah. for the first time, they'd probably be more like, yeah. Yeah, I, don't, no, I was not, guy, not I was not nervous. <laughs> I was not nervous. It's not like he's suddenly like running to get off camera, but I do think he seems a little more uncomfortable answering these questions than he did in the start of the video, you know? And you can kind of see that like a lot of what they talk about seems quite like, fake and like they're trying to portray a certain image and they're trying to like show a certain side of themselves that might not be the real side because they even leave this clip in where Dave says to Bethany tell me what you said in your blog about this so I don't contradict you and I feel like Bethany either kept that in out of laziness because they don't really do much editing or because she thought it could be played off as a joke but I don't really get that impression I think it's about them putting up a front it's very clear in clips like this that Bethany placed so much importance on portraying her marriage as perfect to the public, you know? It really did become her brand, it became her identity, it was everything she was about. And it's clear that Dave didn't want to mess this up for her, which, you know, is kind of commendable, you know, but also it was dishonest on both their parts. He clearly stops caring about this public image so much in more recent years, but we'll see that when we get to it. I was very shocked by what Bethany said here about like claiming most guys aren't nervous for their first time, like has she actually met a man? Even after the hundredth time men can be nervous, even with just a new person men can be nervous. Some men are, some men aren't. Again, it's not a gender thing, it's just an individual thing. It really kind of bothers me when Bethany makes assumptions like this because I feel like she's kind of putting more pressure on any men in the audience who might be watching being like oh well you know you're not a real man if you're nervous if you're and that's obviously not true at all it's okay for men to be nervous it's normal for men to be nervous it's normal for anyone to be and it's also normal not to be it's all good you know i do find it interesting though how after bethany says this dave jumps straight into making jokes and doing silly voices as though he's kind of trying to live up to her expectations of manliness or i don't know maybe he's just been silly i don't know but again it does feel like he was kind of spending a lot of this time performing for her trying to be the man that he thought she expected him to be rather than just who he actually was and he says later on that like this is kind of what he was doing so i think it's interesting that we can see examples of it on camera next up Dave reads out a question and Bethany questions if it's a real question or not she starts to like reel off this answer about biblical perspectives and there's a really interesting sigh from Dave it's really telling I've highlighted it in this clip so you can kind of hear it again but it started making me wonder at this point if their beliefs weren't quite as similar as Bethany wanted us to think and as we get confirmation later you'll see that you know I was right. <laughs> what does a healthy sex life look like? Is that one of the questions? <laughs> yes. Oh, sorry, I, I didn't see it. Well, um, well, well. I did. <laughs> I think a healthy sex life, whether you are single or married, single, I think preparing and understanding it from a biblical perspective and really cool perspective and really having proper expectations and not like, like what you see in the movies isn't you know, it's, it's, I don't think that's even the best sex out there. I think it's like, I think, <laughs> you know, and so I think, um, I think the best that's healthy funny. version of sex is, comes in a relationship, a committed marriage where two people are genuinely trying, striving to love and serve the other. And so I think the more we can develop that mindset and understand what sex truly is all about, then I think that will lead to a very healthy sex life. But it's like the the amount of sex you're going to have or the, um, you know, the frequency, all of that, it's like, that's important to communicate between two people because it might be a little bit different for everyone. And it's interesting because again, they talk more about, they talk more specifically about these beliefs later. And again, Bethany jumps straight in to make it clear that they're totally on the same page. They are, they're totally on the same page when maybe Dave's actions suggest they weren't, and that seems to be the reality. We also start seeing unhealthy behaviors in their relationship, like here about how Dave says how uh, they've been scared to have certain conversations with each other, especially when they were dating, because you know they were worried about how the other person would react and think and all this sort of thing. Again, this doesn't sound healthy, and it's just another example of unhealthy behavior they were displaying and kind of trying to pass off as normal, healthy, perfect, you know? 
Uh, while dating, did you have any doctrinal or lifestyle differences, Ooh. and how did you resolve them? Um, great. doctrinally, we grew up pretty similar. I don't feel like we had a lot of major differences. I feel like you were kind of like thinking through things and questioning things and kind of working things out before you asked me out. I still am doing all of those things. So. He's, you're much more, you're like, I'm... We're different in that way, the way we process and think about things. We're and it's so amazing different in that way. because yeah. I feel like he keeps, he has helped me learn and grow so much and helps me to just like question things in a good way sure. and listen. I feel like I've my, who I listen to and who I learn from has changed a lot and in a good way. And you yeah. just exposed me to a lot of great mindsets or great ways of thinking and things where I'm like, well, this is the way it should be. And it's, you're like, well, why? And it's like, well, oh, actually. Maybe that's not the way. Yeah. Um, and I think the more relational, emotional capital we have together, uh, the more connection that we yeah. have, the more trust we build, um, then For the sure. more those sorts of conversations are not scary to have. Yeah. And um, and I think I think to some degree, while dating, there are just certain conversations that would have been a lot more like, oh that's scary you know i don't yeah. want to talk about that you know and almost like we would we would probably have tended to caricature each other a little bit more than yeah. our views but now we we have trust first and foremost yeah. and so totally. sharing different views is fine he just talked and communicated yeah. a lot and so there were areas where we had differences on um just like certain convictions or more like I don't know, stuff to do with media, things like yeah. that. And so we've kind of landed in a place like if it's going to compromise the other person's like conscience or the person feels more strongly about it in a more conservative sense, yeah. like we will just kind of honor that. But it's more, we, I think we've, it's those sorts of things are always on the table and we're always communicating about yeah. them. But I love it because I feel like we're both willing to grow and change and we really want to love the other person. So it's, yeah, I think that's important sure. and, um, not being each other's holy spirit you know like i yeah. think that's important too so for sure i feel like i i feel like i've probably grown the most of hmm. in that area now despite bethany trying to tell us constantly that she is living her fairy tale their next video together which was also the same month was actually titled conflict fighting and communication in marriage because as we've seen with paul and morgan and bethany and so many other fundies they seem to think that constantly fighting in your first year of marriage is normal to be expected just a part of the process when in reality most healthy relationships don't fight that much listen now for Dave snarky because you all want to know about that here <laughs> god we came up with an idea yeah we want to uh tell you a little bit about our communication <laughs> uh in our marriage <laughs> Because don't you all want to know about that? Okay, I have I've shared a couple times on here, but never with you my thoughts on like mm -hmm. fighting in uh, marriage, yeah. fair fighting, all of that stuff, which I'm very passionate about, and I feel like you are yes. too. And so, yes. I mean, we only have like a couple fights a day, right? Right. <laughs> yes. She jokes. This is not. So this I found incredibly awkward. Like, was she joking? Really? It didn't sound like a joke to me but like i say what do i know also i have to ask why they don't feel comfortable sharing and talking about this stuff with each other like again they kept saying throughout this early period they're scared to have certain conversations with each other and again that comes up later when they're actually being more honest as well i personally have had a lot of very unhealthy dating and relationship experiences i've been in a horribly abusive relationship i've i've been through a lot of crap and for me what i've learned is that one of the biggest red flags and indicators of a toxic relationship and of an unhealthy relationship and of it not working is when you constantly fight over little things little things just blow up or there's constantly lots of little arguments about little things and all that sort of thing when i was with my abuser it felt like i was constantly walking on eggshells because any little thing could set him off you buy the wrong thing for dinner come in at the wrong time you say the wrong thing you leave the wrong thing on the wrong table and it sets off a whole argument and everything's all over the place and yeah you are constantly scared to voice any concerns because it could set him off it could make him angry and violent and all this sort of thing and then I compare that to like actually healthy relationships like the one I'm in now with my partner where we've been together for like god knows how many months like coming up to a year now and we haven't argued once 
we've had talks and concerns and things like that. There was at one point there was a bit of a miscommunication and a misunderstanding that left me a bit upset and I got a bit teary but the minute Kieran realised he'd misunderstood me and the moment I realised that like I'd misunderstood him he immediately apologised to me, I apologised to him and we sat down and we were like okay what do we actually mean? How do we make sure this miscommunication doesn't happen going forwards? How do we work on this together to make sure it doesn't happen again? And it hasn't happened again. So the difference is feeling very safe, being able to open up to someone and like have these concerns and know that you're gonna work on them together as a team rather than it being any kind of blame or anything like that. And there's a difference between saying like, hey, I'm a bit worried about this, can we talk about it? And something being an argument. Like me and Kieran have never raised our voice to each other once. There's been none of that. We've never insulted each other. We've never purposely hurt each other's feelings. It's, it's just a very, very different experience, you know? And while I don't want to say like Bethany and Dave, I, I don't want, when I'm making the comparison to like an abusive relationship, I'm not saying that's what theirs is. I'm just saying for me, lots of constant little fights is just an indicator that there's something very, very wrong. Now you can do what Bethany and Dave have done, which is like to go and get a lot of individual therapy and then work on things together and try and work on your communication and stuff like that. And that is one thing you can do. But for me, I also think a lot of it comes down to compatibility in general and sometimes if you realize you're not compatible with someone it is okay to walk away it is okay to find someone else you know but different ways of doing things next up they actually recommend a book that i've reviewed in depth here on my channel in these couple of videos it's love and respect by emerson egerix and not a great book i'll be honest so mm. we read or listened to the book love and respect yeah uh, by I think Emerson Egrick or something Edridge, like that. Yeah. Edridge. Egridge, whatever Edric. his name is. Eggs and bacon. Eggs and bacon. And uh, he talks, he uses this illustration of stepping on each other's air hoses. Oh yeah. And so you can get into this sort of vicious cycle of a rela your relationship. Yeah. When you treat we treat each other in a certain way, we can start to step on each other's air hoses. And his his structure in the book is, you know, um, men generally, uh, you know, need, want respect and, uh, women generally need, want love. That's, that sort of idea. So that's, that's what he talks. We all know how I feel about that book. And now next up, Dave gets more specific about how they as a couple resolve conflict and the things he likes about Bethany. And I'll be honest, like, I'm pretty impressed with this conversation. This seems really healthy, really mature. And I was impressed until I remembered None of it's true. They've literally said themselves since that like, they didn't do any of this. They weren't resolving conflicts in these healthy ways. They weren't actually treating each other like this. It's all fake and lies, which is a shame. Um, the three things I would say that you do so hey. well. <laughs> this wasn't supposed to be a session. In connection, well, it's not necessarily three things. It's three, it's kind of like three, three steps. Um, I was thinking about this because this means this means a lot to me. I know I'm monopolizing here, but this is just what Bethany does. Uh, so sweet. So first, she makes she makes me feel like when I share with her, like you make me feel like you're listening unjudgmentally, mm -hmm. and like I can share basically. I just share my heart, share you know where my thoughts, feelings, emotions are at, and you give me the safe place and it's very unjudgmental. And so then that that makes me uh, both want to share more, but it also means uh, that when you have something to share, I'm just like naturally, I feel so loved, so respected, so like you've given me such a place mm -hmm. to thrive that I naturally uh, want to be understanding to you and, and love you. And so, so when sweet. a conflict sort of thing comes up, it's almost like it's that groundwork of just how you've treated me that in so many ways allows me to feel uh, just more naturally inclined mm. to not just discount your view or your opinion, uh, but be like, well, she's listened to me non-judgmentally. Maybe I can do the same sort of thing. And like, you know, it's possible that um, it's most likely that you have information and perspectives that I absolutely don't have or am blind to. So, mm, that's so I funny. think that really helps. That's really, really sweet. What about you? Um, are you going to share the other two later? 
the other two. Points. Okay, so I, I said three. I try to do the three points, but I, I mostly just jumble them into one. It's mostly you give me a you give me a place to drive, uh, and you listen non-judgmentally. Uh, that leads to me uh, feeling um, cared for, yeah, cared for and respected, and then. That means that the the next time you're you share with me, I'm just naturally emotionally more likely to. Uh, so sweet. To be, I mean, yeah. when he says three things that are going to be compliments, I don't want to let him go. Oh, that was <laughs> coming into marriage and then being married to you. Um, well, I feel really spoiled because you're extremely patient, extremely kind, and like a peacemaker and like a diff diffuser. <laughs> And that's an amazing thing for me because I can be like very blunt and very black and white and very much like get into my way. And so when you treat me so kindly and softly and gently, it like totally like, so I feel like you help me to become the woman that I really want to be. And Again, this bit all sounds really nice, doesn't it? But how much was actually real? Doesn't seem like very much of it was. And then, as far as I can tell, we don't hear from them together for a long, long time, maybe around 18 months. But in the meantime, Kristen and Bethany have some discussions over on their podcast talking about their beliefs about marriage, dating, relationships, sex, and all that kind of thing. So we're going to take a look at that. In January 2021, Kristen and Bethany decided to make a video about purity culture, and it is just so bad. Basically, they're like, look, we've heard purity culture is bad and damaging, so we don't want to say anything supporting that, except everything we teach is actually supporting purity culture. And we're going to tell some stories about how we grew up in that kind of environment, and it was so great, but we're not supporting it, honest. If you're damaged by purity culture, it's because you weren't holy enough, not because there's a problem with purity culture. It's really, really bad. It's full of contradictions. I just have a lot of problems with this video. So I put in my comment box, like, or in my little poll box, define purity culture. And these were the responses. You're basically worthy if you're a virgin. And if mm. you're not, then you are um, not a virgin. Um, yeah, it's too virginity focused sometimes. Um, someone says purity culture is the toxic idea that virginity is everything. Mm -hmm. Virginity is the best gift you can offer your spouse. I think that's actually... Um, like a pretty good description in a lot of ways of just the like kind of like the idolization or the upholding of like okay the sexual act of virginity and that is like the most important thing it is everything about you that's where your worth and value come from that's like yeah. the height of being a woman and you know that is the ultimate thing you can give your spouse um, another one says people that people saying that sex is bad and not explaining that it's a gift from God yes. a super super yeah. good way to articulate that um, another one says it pressures women to stay pure in quotes it's literally as simple as that so the irony here is that these are all core values that Kristen and Bethany continue to push and promote in all of their content. They did it before this video and they did it after this video. Yet they go on to defend this, or at least Kristen does. Only their definition of purity is the proper biblical one, you know? Everyone else is doing it wrong. Just listen to them and their only correct biblical perspective. Um, but I think one thing's clear, and this is where we have to approach this topic with so much, I just think humility and compassion yeah. to say that people have been hurt by yeah. having a wrong understanding of purity, yeah. right? Because if and it's not, not, not a biblical view, right, like that's it's what I'm not saying. coming from Yeah, scripture. like if it's not a, a biblical understanding of purity, it's not biblical. Yeah. It's not like if the gospel isn't at the heart of our understanding of God's heart for holiness, for, for purity, for his children, what he's called us to walk in. Um, if that's not at the heart of it, yeah. it's not a proper understanding of purity. Totally. And so a wrong understanding of purity lived out puts so much weight and pressure and a burden yeah. on us that God did not intend for us totally. to carry. So I think it's so important to recognize that so many have been hurt. Yeah. And I don't think it's because they ha they've been living out a biblical yeah. understanding, but sadly have been living out the opposite. And that totally. is hurtful. And that's in this conversation, we want to debunk what it's not. So apparently, according to Kristen, when other people promote purity culture, it can be damaging and dangerous. But when they do it, it's not because they weren't doing it biblically and properly and the right way it's their own fault and I really have an issue with that. I do think this was kind of like one of the peak harmful times for Girl Defines content that they were putting out. It, it was pretty horrific at this time and a lot of the time they were making this harmful content and then using the excuse of but it's not our view 
It's the biblical view, so you can't argue with this. It really bothered me. Like, no, sorry, there are many, many interpretations of the Bible. It's one, not really one book, but like, it's a text that everyone interprets in a very, very different way. And the stuff that you're spewing on your channel is in fact your view. You can say it's the biblical view, but it's your biblical view, you know? It's still open open to interpretation and that's what you've done. You'll see this again in the moment. They come back with lots of things like, we're not shaming anyone. We're just sharing the biblical perspective, which is the only right one. And if you're not doing that, then you're bad, but because God says so, not us. <sighs> no, you're just shaming people. Like, and if they're gonna do that, I'm like, just own up to it, you know? Next up, Bethany tells us this very bizarre fact. I had a purity ring and mm -hmm. my husband Dave actually wears it on a, <laughs> like as a necklace. Uh, we put it on a chain Aww. and you, can you will get DMs or emails saying, hey, you should not even talk about purity because that's shaming me. You know, yeah. if I believe that I can have sex before marriage and I'm just following my heart doing what I think is right for me, you have no right to tell me. Um, and so there's this idea that shame that to tell anyone or to even suggest like biblically, well, not even to tell, but to share an idea that is to share different a, yeah. from what someone else would mm -hmm. believe. Yeah, exactly. And so if our worldview, speaking as Kristen and Bethany here, yeah. is coming, if we're saying we want to go to God's word, say, what does God's word say? Let's get back to God's word. And God's word is calling us to purity, to holiness, which it is. Then to be faithful to the word, we need to have a well-rounded gospel center perspective of that. But we're not going to not say yeah. that God calls us to um, purity because the Bible does. And so if yeah. someone says, you are shaming me by saying I should walk in purity, then we have to say, okay, well, let's talk about shame. Yeah. What is shame? Because there is a biblical and unbiblical view of shame and you know here's a question when we sin mm -hmm. should we feel shame at this point i just think they lack a lot of self-awareness don't they you know like they're defending their position by being like but we're just sharing the right way to do things and we might be shaming you but it's not the biblical definition of shame so it's okay i mean you're the sinner so it's your own fault they really lack self-awareness. The thing is, they claim they're just sharing their view, and if they were, that would be fine, but I'll keep saying it. There's nothing wrong with the way that they've chosen to live their lives. If it works for them, brilliant. The whole wait until marriage thing, wearing a purity ring, whatever. They've chosen to do that, and it works for them, apparently. Nothing wrong with that, it's fine. But they refuse to acknowledge that anyone living a different life to them could be happy and fulfilled. They just don't want to admit that that can happen. They constantly call people who aren't them sinners and they put them down and they, and they shame them. And that is bad. That's where the problem lies. People aren't complaining because Girl Define talk about purity. People are mad because Kristen and Bethany act like they're better than everyone else. They think they're better than everyone else and they judge everyone else who does things differently to them. And then again, they double down on more victim blaming when it comes to people who have been hurt by purity culture. That's why it's so important too for us as individuals, as girls, as women, to be in the word for ourselves. And we emphasize this over mm -hmm. and over on the podcast here because if you are not in God's word for yourself and someone else tells you like, you know, you need to save sex for marriage and that's the most important thing about you as a woman. If you're not in God's word and they're saying that's what the Bible says mm -hmm. and maybe that was your experience. You grew up in a church where they told you stuff like that um, or that is the most important thing, you know, about, you know, your future or your marriage, whatever it is, you might think, oh, wow, that, okay. And then you, you know, later on you're like, it was, I had these terrible experiences mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm trying to recover from that. Um, we need to be women who are in the word, looking to God's word for ourselves so we can see, okay, what does God actually say about sex? What does he say about holiness and purity and our hearts and humility? What does he have to say about this? And so if you are not being a woman who is in the word, um, how are you going to compare what people are saying to what God actually says? They refuse to admit that the whole problem could be because of this entire culture. It could be because of organized religions. It could be because these things cause actual real trauma. But no, they're like, they just weren't holy enough. They were own fault, really. So what are some of those wrong, unbiblical narratives that we can believe about purity? Yeah, I would say especially in, I mean, I think we're mostly talking about those who grew up in like a Christian, some form of Christian right. religious upbringing. Um, I think a big one is that basically sex is a bad and scary thing. So it's like, don't talk about sex, you know, don't think about sex. Um, don't you dare have it. Like <laughs> sex is considered a big no-no in kind of like the purity culture. And then it's a hush-hush topic. There isn't really a lot of talk about it. Um, and so it's like, no, um, you should 
you know, sex is terrible. But then once you get married, ding, turn the light on. Yes. Sex is great, you know, and you should have a lot of it and, you know, make and your husband yeah. happy. And it's like, so I lived for what, however many years, 20 so many years, if you got married in your 20s and I was supposed to be like, no, 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 it's terrible. It's bad. Don't even think about it. Don't talk about it. And then like, all right, celebration. Flip like, the switch. They're right, you know, it is wrong, but they've been contributing to this. They are contributing to this. Even now, the fact that they have to preface everything they say about sex with, but only in the context of heterosexual monogamous marriage, is harmful. They're the ones telling people to flip a switch after marriage. They're the ones promoting this stuff. I like that they're taking a step in the right direction in terms of calling out some aspects of purity culture. I have to give them credit for that, but at this point, doesn't feel like it's enough when they're still literally promoting the exact thing they're also labeling as harmful. Again, lack of self-awareness, isn't it? Next up, in March 2021, Kristen and Bethany were back again to talk about their wedding nights. Again. At this point, I'm pretty sure I know more about Bethany's first time than I remember about my own, but... Here we are. This podcast is simply titled, Is it awkward being a virgin on your wedding night? A lot of you know, yeah, we were virgins on our wedding night and it was the first time we'd ever had sex ever. And so we get asked a lot because, you know, we'll talk about God's design for sexuality, marriage. And so like people will ask us, like we said directly, was it awkward? Was it ah, weird? Like, do you okay. regret it? The world says it doesn't matter. You put you first. If you feel it, go for it. Yeah. That's the opposite of denying oneself for the good of the other. That's yeah. self-sacrifice. I am caring about someone else more than myself. That's the gospel. And in marriage, sex is a celebration of that covenant commitment, right? You stood on an altar. You said, till death do us part. I'm committing to this person. That's where sex belongs. But outside of marriage, there's no covenant. And so basically you're doing with your body what you aren't doing with your life. You're, you're actually living a lie essentially because you're saying, I am becoming one with this person, but my body is becoming one, but my heart is not in this covenant. My life is not in, the, in this covenant. And so essentially it's a false celebration. It's not the real deal, which is why it's yeah. so destructive. It leaves so many chasing that fulfillment, following their heart. It leaves them empty on the other side because that covenant, which is the foundation in which sex is to be celebrated, it's not there. And so at the end of the day, it's just empty pleasure. It doesn't last. It doesn't fulfill as yeah. God designed it to be in that covenant. So Speak for yourself. I've not experienced that at all. Kristen then goes on to share her own story about her wedding night, including how they didn't dare speak about any specific details about sex in case it tempted them. Okay, I guess. Don't recommend it, but... I don't know, I've kind of always said, like, if you can't speak to your partner about sex openly, you probably shouldn't be having sex yet, you know, but... We had set up boundaries and, you know, as we got to know each other, like just getting to know each other's hearts and building that friendship. Like I shared a for few sure. episodes ago and, you know, dating. And then obviously y'all know we're married and we've been married for almost 10 years. So we did get married, but neither of us had ever had sex before. And, you know, going into that night, I will say like there is, you know, you have that understanding biblically, but you're like, I've never experienced this. Mm -hmm. I would say the thing that really helped each of us is just preparing by reading really like God, like Christ centered um, teachings on sex. And, you know, I don't recommend like you get too nitty gritty, like way before you're married, but just yeah. like, you know, we had had a good understanding, but then as it got closer to the wedding day, just really reading some things that people had recommended, like good resources. And like Zach actually did the sweetest thing. Um, he was like, I really want to model what Christ was for the, his disciples and for us, you know, the people when he came. And so he had a little bowl of water and he washed my feet. And it was like, Aww. if anyone, my sister knows that I have really stinky feet. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> so Zach actually knew that too. Like I just have really stinky That's feet, hilarious. full disclosure, but he washed my feet and he said, I want this to be just a picture of how I want to serve you and love you in our relationship. I want to love you like Christ. Yep. Did not need to know that at all. Would have been much happier if I hadn't heard it. And then what surprises me is Bethany actually comes in with some good advice, which is not what I expected from her. A friend described it to me this way, like preparing for intimacy, preparing for that honeymoon. Um, she kind of described like, okay, when you're engaged, you don't just go from not talking about it, not thinking about it to, okay, now you're on your honeymoon, full speed ahead. She was like, it's a little bit more like a ramp. So you mm. start as the day approaches, you get more 
um, I guess, specific with your conversations, with uh, counseling, or maybe even some questions you might talk about together, things you might discuss. As you get closer to the wedding, you start kind of like ramping up into that moment as far as like even internally, like mentally, you might be like, okay, um, how am I, you know, how am I feeling about this? How am I thinking about this? And you start preparing emotionally. Like you might even, you know, as you're preparing and maybe buying some fun things that you might wear on the honeymoon, you start just mentally getting yourself in that place. Because if you, if you're just going from zero to 100, as far as like even allowing yourself to think about God's design for it, it might be a bit of a shock. So Mm -hmm. I think that for Mm -hmm. me, that was actually extremely helpful. What I found is that There are a lot of people, especially for women, who talk about sex in a very negative way, even when you're preparing for your honeymoon, like, ooh, it's going to be so awkward, or, you know, like, ah, he's just going to want it so much more than you, or whatever Mm. it is, not realizing, like, wow, our thoughts directly fuel our emotions, and if I go into my honeymoon thinking, like, oh, this is going to be so weird, or this is going to be the worst, or, ah, what are we going to do? Like, (laughs) I'm going to feel really uncomfortable. So instead... I started developing a really positive, beautiful, Christ-centered, servant-hearted mindset about sex and about intimacy and even just the gift of being able to share my body with my husband and love him in that way. Even things like lingerie, you know, like instead of being like, oh, but, you know, I... I have cellulite, you know, like, no, this is, I can love my husband and I, God gave me this body that I can love him with and he gets to love me with his body. And so instead developing such a servant hearted, loving mindset, I'm telling you that preparation mentally helped me so much as I approached the honeymoon. Yeah. Good point here. This is a really big problem. However, they give a terrible and dangerous solution. And remember this because it comes back up later, right? This solution of just like, oh, we'll fix it by having a servant mindset still shames women for wanting and enjoying sex. And I would say that a lot of content that Girl Define makes is actually a big part of this problem because what they still do is call women who have sexual and lustful thoughts and feelings sinners. They shame women for being sexual beings, you know? They still give people these strict rules and parameters for how and where and when and who they're allowed to have sex with. And they still make sex all about the man. Kristen and Bethany constantly talk about serving the husband, pleasing the husband, loving your husband, rather than framing sex as an activity that couples enjoy together, you know? If we want women to stop talking about sex in this way, we need to start framing the conversation entirely differently. And we need to stop making women feel like their sexuality is something to be policed or ashamed of. Then Bethany says this and sets this boundary, which is interesting considering how much else she shared and told the world, but yeah, fine. It's really nobody else's business. Like your honeymoon process and journey (laughs) and those early days and weeks and months of marriage. And there is no rule that says you have to fully like have sex the first night of your, Mm. of your honeymoon. And there's like this big expectation. If you want to, great. Um, And something that I intentionally decided I would never share about is, oh, did we have sex the first night? Did we not? Maybe it was two nights later. Maybe not. I'm not ever going to share that because I think that it's so important to go into your honeymoon with this mindset of, hey, this is brand new. We get to love each other. Mm. And you know, say it takes a couple days as we like really get comfortable and you're enjoying all the wonderful gifts that maybe you've never enjoyed before and you slowly ease into it that's totally fine Mm -hmm. you know like but yeah actually again this advice is pretty good take your time you don't need to rush things this is something i've spoken about in other videos and actually recommended on my channel before so good on bethany for saying this really next up bethany complains about and judges other women who want their first time to be with someone other than someone they're married to Again, this bothers me. It's like she does one good thing and then has to undo it all by being harmful again. Very frustrating. It's like, so you're telling me that it's more comfortable to do the first time with someone who has no commitment to you, who has no care for you, or who has no long-term, say, I'm going to lay down your life for you? Like, why is that more comfortable? I don't think it is. I think the most comfortable place to fully reveal and enjoy this moment with would be with the person who has said, forever i love you and i am here for you no matter what do they not realize that you can be committed to someone without being married that's a thing that's allowed people do it it's okay like i know i don't ever like to speak about specifics when it comes to my own sexual experiences but what i will say is that to this day i have absolutely no regrets about my first time and it wasn't with someone i was married to (laughs) in fact it wasn't even with someone that i thought i'd be with for my entire life 
I kind of knew we would go our own ways at some point in the future, but it was with someone I was very comfortable with. It was a lovely experience. It was with someone I loved. They loved me, I loved them. We were committed to each other, but it also had no added pressure that I felt like, oh God, if I do this, I have to stay with them forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, and this is my only person ever. That would have been pressure that I didn't want so I didn't have it. <laughs> I wouldn't change that experience for anything in the world, it was great, but, but I can understand why my experience is something that other people wouldn't want. Other people want different experiences and I can understand that. So why can't Kristen and Bethany? They got the experience they wanted, why can't they understand that some women, some people, want different things? Bethany then finally gives some hints that her sex life in these first few years of marriage wasn't as great as she'd been making out for all this time. Um, the last thing I would say is that really, really, really view that beginning year, even the first few years as a journey. Don't view it as like, okay, well, we are failures or we just, our bodies are broken because we don't, you know, we're whatever that arrival experience it is, whatever that mm -hmm. is in your mind, like we're not there. And oh no, like this isn't feel the way that I th thought it should feel. Um, I am telling you that it is such a journey and, um, you know, I, you know, there, there's so much stuff, there's so much stuff that can happen in the, even that first year that oftentimes kind of resolves itself. Like this is a little TMI, but it's something that so many young um, newlyweds deal with. Like I got a really bad UTI a few months after being married and I got it treated with antibiotics, but the antibiotics didn't really work. And then I got a horrible kidney infection and then they didn't diagnose it right. And I was literally really for days in bed, like mm. just literally I thought I was going to die. And, and for it those was who horrible. Are, might not know UTI stands for urinary tract infection. Okay. Right. Yeah. And okay. it's something that's common. They will often call it like honeymooners sickness. Yeah. You know, it's very common common, but it was so just as a result of being a newlywed. And I was like, wow, I'm like two months married and now I'm on my deathbed, you know? And it's like, what in the world? Again, I think Bethany's doing some good here in that she's helping remove any stigma around things like UTIs. I think that's really important. I think that's really good. But can we also stop acting like UTIs are inevitable because they're not. Not everyone gets UTIs. We have to remember that there are ways you can prevent them. And also some people are just more susceptible to them than others. Some people will go their whole lives without one, some people will get multiple ones. Like, it's not an inevitability, but it's also good she's reducing the stigma around it, so I don't know. This is why comprehensive sex ed is important, and Bethan, Beth, Bethan, Bethany and Kristen need it. Like, I think it's good that Kristen and Bethany are trying to talk about this stuff more. I think it's good that people like me try and correct a lot of misinformation and stuff on my channel, but ultimately, young people need more than just some YouTubers who are just chatting in their house, you know? They actually need to learn this stuff from trained professionals. They actually need to make sure they're getting credible and comprehensive education. In March 2021, Bethany also did a podcast by herself where she just spoke about herself for 40 minutes. Here are some highlights, including a bizarre admission of how she didn't really know why she was wearing her purity ring as a kid, but hey, it seemed fun. So rewind to when I was about 13 years old, and, um, you know, I remember I had been taught a lot about um, just God's good design for men and women and marriage and the value of my body and all of that. And so I remember um, my parents did take me out and they said, hey, we want to get you a ring. I was a representation of just your value and how much we love you and how much God loves you and any commitments that you want to make to really strive to honor God in, you know, just your body or in your relationships over, you know, the coming years. And I did call it a purity ring. Uh, but I want to say that it was for me in that moment as a 13 year old girl, my heart really was, um, I would say like half about honoring God and half like not really knowing exactly what this all meant, um, but thinking it was really fun and a really great idea. So I then there's this story, which I think is quite telling about why Bethany tries so hard to pretend she has a perfect marriage. And so um, as the years went on, I really just assumed I would get married at like 19, 20, 21. All my little girl fairy tale dreams would come true and I would settle down with my cute little house, white picket fence, and probably many kids, cute dog, um, you know, just everything I ever wanted. And it sounds very naive, but you know, as like a teenager, it's like, what else are you gonna imagine? I'm like, oh, my life's gonna be horrible. I mean, maybe some, but like for me, I was hoping for the best and wanting what I thought was like the fairy tale dream. It seems to me she spent so long centering her life around the idea of marriage and assuming she'll be happy when she gets it that maybe at least at this point in 2021, she was at a stage where she was just ad unable to admit that it wasn't everything she'd built it up to be in her head. But then she does end this by saying some genuinely sweet stuff about her husband, how she feels about him, and how she felt about him before they started dating and stuff, so this is actually quite nice. This is sweet. Like I say, I do think they do actually like each other. It's nice really grew just to really like Dave and I really just liked so much about him and I felt so just excited and passionate and uh, passionate for life and you know just so like just 
I just enjoyed being with him and I enjoyed um, the person that he encouraged me to be. I enjoyed the person I encouraged him to be. I felt like we were better when we were together. Um, and he was just a really, had a really genuine heart before God. And I love that so much. Next up, we have a YouTube video from May, 2021. And this is where Bethany first tells us that she's thinking of, of changing the target audience for the Girl Define content and why. A lot of you have been requesting for us over at Girl Define to start talking more about some of the current seasons that we're in. A lot of you have been following us for many years and you're like, hey, I'm married now or I'm a wife and a mom and I wanna hear more about that. So yeah, honestly, I think growing and changing with your audience is a pretty good thing. It's fine, good. I don't have any complaints about it. Some people are finding it a bit weird, but you know, I think they were maybe acting a little young for their ages before and now it's good to see them actually maturing and growing and developing, you know? I don't, know, I don't actually have anything to complain about that. Um, Bethany then goes on to answer more audience questions about marriage, mum life and being a wife. And this first one is a pretty great follow up to that podcast clip about Bethany's you know, fairy tale idea of marriage and all that stuff. And again, explains why she clings so hard to the image of a perfect marriage, you know? Is it anything like what you expected when you were single? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, in some ways for me, I didn't think that marriage would ever become my reality. So for me, I kind of feel like I get to live my dream. And I know that sounds cheesy to some people or whatever, but I love being married and I love the idea of doing life with my best friend. And I really never thought as I was single that that would become my reality. And I thought that God might call me to just serve him as a single woman, which would have been fine. But he gave me this blessing and I feel so grateful for it. So when I look and I see Davey and I see Dave, I just feel like, wow, this is the dream I never thought I would have. But the cracks do start to show in other answers. And interestingly enough, these are things that David later came out to say she really, really struggled with. So this is interesting. Oh, a question. Finding the difference between speaking well of your husband and being honest about his flaws. I would say that probably, at least in my experience, my natural first words out of my mouth are to correct and um, speak of my husband's flaws, even if they're like just preference things. So for me, um, that's what comes naturally. So my focus is not on speaking and telling him about his flaws. Um, for me, it's more working on being encouraging and speaking words of life and living out the fruit of the spirit. That's for me personally, because naturally I want to point out flaws and want to speak my mind and my opinions all the time. And so that's not really going to give to a flourishing, healthy marriage where the other person feels alive and respected and, um, like they are good at something. They're going to always feel like down. So that's personally for me, my focus. Finally, Dave comes back into the videos after nearly 18 months and they make a video titled five tips to thrive in your first year of marriage, which is quite ironic. And this is one of the first times we overtly see Dave's resentment and how much he contradicts Bethany's image of what their marriage is. This video is very, very telling. The whole interaction here that we're gonna see now, this is so awkward. And all I see is a man who does not wanna be there and just really doesn't believe half the words he's saying. Let's just get through the material here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna share five things, five tips to thrive in your first year of marriage. Uh, these, are, these are our ideas on what it really takes to have a first year that sings. This is what we should have done our first year. <laughs> hey, we did a lot of these. Yeah, yes, all right. Um, the first thing is to forgive quick, which basically is another way of saying being quick to forgive, which is another way of saying um, when your spouse does something that you don't like, um, be gracious <laughs> and speedy in your actions of forgiveness. If you think that's awkward, it only gets worse. Right. Should you forgive though? I mean, if, what if the other person does apologize? Well, I think- Or isn't sorry. Bringing it up and communicating about it and forgiving them for how they sinned against you um, and choosing to be like, mm. Lord, you deal with him now. You know? Oh. So can you really say that you've forgiven someone if you're going, Lord, deal with him now? <laughs> 
but uh, not to but get moving on to maybe the second one. In the next clip, they talk about trying to spend actual time together, and once again, note Dave's reaction here. It seems like what Bethany portrays as happening might not be what's actually happening in the real world between them. And then Dave contradicts something Bethany says and is like, oh, but I thought you said you'd be mad. And it's, it's just very awkward. That's the only word for this video. So awkward. Wait, no, right. This is actually your point. You brought this one up. Hi. <laughs> this point is called point number five. Enjoy time together. So do you want to... I love time with you. And I you. <laughs> Do okay. you want to say a, a word? A little word. Um, I actually, when you brought this up, I loved it so much because this is something, it's like the best, you know? I mean, it sounds silly because when you're dating, oftentimes, like I'm not speaking about everyone, you know, and we're really generically speaking to relationships and marriages that are striving to honor God and like mm -hmm. striving to be a healthy marriage. If you are not in a healthy marriage, like you probably need to like seek counsel like immediately. Counseling. You know, guys, counseling I'm immediately. A fan. And we're talking That's about like mere, you know, healthy relationships on right. both, both people are wanting to do the right thing. So enjoying time together, like dating, I don't know, that seems like what it's all about, like just enjoying time, getting to know each other, like going on dates, and then you get I married. thought it was about figuring out whether or not you should be married intentionally. That's what I thought, <laughs> <Better>. <laughs> That's what I thought it was about. Bold, you know? Um, but then when you get married, sometimes that intentionality of like, let's try to have it fun together and enjoy time together can kind of, right. I don't know, like be so easy to just like disappear. So It feels like we're listening in on a conversation that they should be happening off camera with a counselor. Like we shouldn't be hearing this. But then again, that's what I've been thinking the entire time Bethany's been talking about her marriage on camera. So what's new? Just like we decided, okay, let's just get out of the house so that we don't get in this groove of just like, yeah. okay, get in the routine, then Davy goes down, and then, you know, into the evening. It's like, it kind of broke up that like groove, yeah. and it, I don't know, it made the evening more fun. Takes a, I mean, maybe, so why wouldn't we do that? Is it the effort? Is it the fact like, yeah. I need to get them, get them in the, the car, drive. Totally. Get them out of the car, put them in the high chair, order. <laughs> <laughs> so like, or just things like, you know, we try to, like, ways we try to enjoy time together. We try to find little activities we like Th oh, to wait, do together. Oh, I have to intro. Oh. Things we like to do together. Go ahead. Um, how do you say it? Sudoku? 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 Sudoku, whatever. Um, we both enjoy doing that. Then we get kind of Dave's first admission of him talking about what he thinks is really one of the problems in the marriage. And that's that he feels like he has to take the blame for everything and nothing and they laugh it off in this clip but bear in mind that this is something that was genuinely bothering him and he was genuinely struggling with so it's really important to find things to do that you both enjoy mm -hmm. and so he was saying you know give an example of, of something that oh, you know, we both like something. to do and <laughs> there's a, it was a hair i thought it was like a roach oh sorry Sorry, that was probably my fault. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's just a very odd section where it's like they struggle of, they kind of struggle to list things that they enjoy doing together. And they eventually come up with a bunch of stuff, but it seems like it's kind of hard for them to think about. So this does make me feel quite sorry for them. I think on both, on both sides, it's really important to, to find those things that are mutually uh, enjoyable. Totally. You know, we both do like doing Sudoku on this. It's kind of really random, random, but we like, you know, just sit, sitting there and staring at this page for a while. And I think that's a six. <laughs> yes. oh, okay. All right. Oh, then that means that's a three. Okay. It's fine. <laughs> so that's one thing we found that we like to do together. Is there maybe maybe to right before we wrap it up? Is there like maybe one more thing you can think of that we like to both do together? Yeah, we love to like. I mean, we love. There was a show or two we saw. Yeah. Well, and we love hanging out at coffee shops together. That's when we true. Can. Yeah. Um, we love to. I think we love to um, like hang out with friends. Like, yeah. You know, like if it's like a couple we both get along with really well, or my family lives in town, we like going over to my yeah. family's house. Um, I mean, we both, if it's the right kind of little adventure, like, yeah. oh, a new place, a new spot, um, you know, I think we both like that. Yeah. Um, I don't know, things, simple things. We're not talking like dramatic stuff. It's like super simple, basic things, sure. you know, outside sure. of like just, you know, I don't know, being home. Yeah. So, Moving on to August 2021, 
and Bethany Dragstave back on the Girl Defined podcast to discuss our Christian love story again. Honestly, a lot of this stuff is just kind of boring, repetitive stuff we've all heard before, nothing new or exciting really, not that interesting, until around 50 minutes in, when Bethany starts on one of her judgmental rants, and Dave jumps straight up and contradicts her. It was unexpected. Okay, so the thing that I like I loved most about our dating and engagement nice. was just like we didn't waste time like we were and which I've heard other people say this and I really like that like you are only you should only be in the relationship as long as it takes you to figure out if you want to marry each other like why are these relationships that are going for like three years like what is the purpose yeah, what are you doing what, what are you doing and I totally hey no shame for anyone who is in an extended relationship that is all fine <laughs> and we do not judge so yeah kind of big difference in opinions here Dave's clearly open to other types of relationships existing <laughs> Bethany isn't this led me to ask questions like, you know, I wonder if this has been an issue between them before with like contradicting opinions and stuff like that. I do wonder if Dave struggles with Bethany's judgmentalness. I wonder if Bethany struggles with Dave's slightly more openness, you know? There's more about Bethany's very strict ideas of what a relationship should be. Obviously all this stuff is ridiculous. Not everything has to end in marriage. Not everything has to be her way. Other people exist. Okay, um, I'm saying like you, I, I don't see the purpose of dating when you are like, you can't get married. Like, okay, you're 16 and you're like, well, I don't even want to get married until I'm 21. Like, so I don't see a lot of purpose in starting to date then. I personally am a big fan and we've talked a lot about this on Girl Define and wrote all about it and love to find. So grab a copy of that book um, of not dating until you can actually consider the idea of marriage. As I've said in many, many of my other videos, there are so many more really good reasons to date someone without wanting to be married to them, you know, or wanting to be married at all. Sometimes you just want to get to know someone new, have some fun, share some experiences with someone. You want to learn more about other people, learn more about yourself. Maybe you want physical intimacy and friendship without a romantic commitment, you know? There's all sorts of good reasons to date someone without wanting marriage. I'm second Kobe, you're tangled baby bean, why don't you come help? Sorry, poor baby got tangled in the microphone cable. So yeah, there's plenty of good reasons to date people without necessarily wanting marriage in your life, ever. What's interesting is I think they recorded this before they recorded the last video we watched, but they posted the other one first. And what's interesting is that there are things Bethany contradicts herself on that Dave literally calls her out, calls her out for in that video, so it... Interesting. It's quite nice to see him have a bit of backbone like that, you know? We, like, marriage is so much more than just the dating. The dating is, the purpose of it is to set you up for like, okay, do I want to spend, spend the rest of my life with this person? Would they make a great husband? Would they make a great father? Not just do they make a fun boyfriend? Because there are a lot of guys out there that can give you a good time and make a fun boyfriend, but they're not really, like, serious about Christ. They don't have that serving, sacrificial quality. Dating, I don't know, that seems like what it's all about, like, just enjoying time, getting to know each other, like, going on dates, and then you get I married. thought it was about figuring out whether or not you should be married intentionally. <laughs> That's what, <laughs> what I thought it was about. Also, what's interesting is listen to this next clip and contrast it with Dave in that last video when he says, this is what we should have done. I feel like, you know, you often hear of these like horror stories, like the first year of marriage is so hard. Like, I think we bypass that in so many ways because of all the work we did in our dating and engagement. And so uh, these, are, these are our ideas on what it really takes to have a first year that sings. <laughs> this is what we should have done. Sounds like actually, yeah, you didn't bypass anything. <laughs> Let's have another time jump to February 2022 and Kristen and Bethany invited both their husbands again to come on the podcast with them for Christian men answer your questions about love, romance and sex. And again, in this one, Dave sounds even less enthusiastic than before, but Bethany is still trying to push their perfect marriage narrative and it just seems like he's over it at this point. But babe, why don't you tell them, like, I don't know all the things like Kristen said how much you're in love with me you know just all the good stuff well, we laid a great so. foundation for the intro it was we crushed it I don't think I even answered that question yeah, <laughs> oh how much you you, you said go ahead you and said like a ton. that one. Oh, that's true I started with that all right okay. Dave Bethany I love you so much we uh, so you want like our, our dating yeah, yeah or like okay. just like a quick overview well I yeah, I was very interested in Bethany, and I thought she was awesome, and she was, um, she didn't really fit into my categories and boxes, and I thought that was hot. <laughs> and so I, and I, um, I stood I, head and shoulders above everyone. <laughs> uh, I eventually asked her out, and we went on a date, and it was great, and then we were in a relationship like one week, week later. <laughs> Yes, it was very fast. Uh-huh. We last October we celebrated our three year anniversary. And 
it's awesome. <laughs> It's and awesome. Uh, we we have more fun now than we did before. That's true. You know, every year gets better. Then Dave finally brings up, probably explicitly for the first time, that their marriage has not been perfect and that there have been a lot of issues in the past. Do you feel like um we're like in a different, a better place like three years in? Do you feel like it's deeper than it was when we first got married? Uh, yes, I think so. I think it's a lot. It's especially you know what starting our third year, I feel like. Uh, we are off to a positive start mm. just in the sense of like where we're at from a totally. like how we're uh, what do you say like how we're positioning ourselves I feel like I feel like it's easy to position ourselves it has been easy to position ourselves as either like rolling with what we've done from the very beginning uh, on the one hand yeah. or um, or kind of like being discontent with uh with where we're at mm -hmm. but I feel like where we've come to is more of like wanting to grow and wanting to learn how to love each other better yeah um uh, well, at the same time, sort of accepting the whole entire journey. Mm. So it feels good to have that momentum, yeah. uh, feeling like we're in a place of wanting to grow and learn yep. uh, rather than being like three years in, we got this, you know, it's totally. almost like the opposite. But at the same time, it's not the sort of despair. Like, yeah. we don't know, eh, you know, we just, it's all bad. It's more like, this is a really positive direction, but we're also like learning and that's what makes it positive. Yeah, I totally agree. More of like a less of, we know everything more like, humble, right. like, oh, we want to learn and grow so that we can yeah. get to those deep members. Exactly. We've, we've, I mean, within that time, we've hit, hit a number of things that are like, oh, this is really good to take a closer look at. Here's some character things that have mm -hmm. come up. Um, I'd like to. I'd like to be able to work that out rather than having to deal with uh, that recycling itself yeah. for the next 10 years. Um, totally. I would like this, this negative character trait, you know, in myself to to um, uh, to be more, um, I'd like to mature Correct. in that area, you know? Yeah. And so mm -hmm. things like that on both of our on both of our ends, I think are making us feel more, even more connected, more dedicated. Totally. We're both seeking, we're both trying to seek like godly um, uh, help. Totally. Yeah, individually and together. So. Then there's some really weird stuff about how Kristen and Bethany don't get their husband's gifts for Valentine's Day. It's a really small thing. It's not really important, but it just kind of, bothered me a bit because I was like why I get it's like a commercial holiday and blah 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 and if you're against it in terms of consumerism consumerism and commercialism that's fine I get that but if you expect gifts from your partner why aren't you getting your partner something as well it just seems like it should be a two-way thing to me I don't know. The revelation that Bethany and Dave's marriage isn't as perfect as they made out is discussed a bit further in their next video from April 2022 titled The Highs and Lows of Our Marriage with David and Bethany. This video literally starts out with a moment of Dave looking at Bethany and saying, I don't like you. I have watched this clip so many times and I don't get it. What is this? Is it meant to be a joke? Is it like a Freudian slip? I don't know what he means or why he says it but it's all awkward as hell but we just want to share i guess some things that have helped us to have i don't know <laughs> what i don't like you <laughs> helped us to have uh, like i guess a good happy thriving i don't know first things that have <laughs> first few years of marriage yeah things that have helped so, things that have helped then they go on to have more conversations about their relationship, which again, I feel like they should be having in private and off camera. I feel like I shouldn't be seeing this stuff. Like it's too private and personal, yet here I am watching it and now sharing it with all of you. We've always had a really good marriage, but we've both been talking about how like 2022 has been like this just new awesome level. And I don't know, um, I don't know exactly why that is. I feel like we're both being very intentional to grow individually. Might be, um, yeah, might be it. <laughs> and, and so it's just been like a launching pad towards growing closer. Just, I don't know. I know for me, it's like personally working on like my motivations and desires and just like what my priorities are in life. And um, I feel like those have been changing a lot. What if, what, yeah. what happened? Um, so, well, I'll share for, I don't, I won't share your stuff, but I'll share my stuff. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm um, asking what happened so, like, with you, because yeah. you've been changing more and faster than I anticipated. Then Bethany shares about seeing a biblical counselor who's helped her by giving her some advice, which the advice as an outsider sounds terrible, but if it works for her, good on her, I guess. Dave sits there like he's hearing all this for the first time, which is very odd. His reaction's confusing. I reached out to a biblical counselor from, um, I don't know what the website is, biblicalcounseling.com, I'll link it below. Anyways, and we just had our ninth visit today, actually, wow. and meeting with her has been like the most incredible experience ever. She's just been so helpful in helping me to see like what, like biblically, what my priorities need to be, maybe certain 
um, motivations and desires and just ugh, like, you know, mm -hmm. I have a type of personality where I get to the end of the day and if I feel like I did enough, then I feel really good about myself. And mm -hmm. if I don't feel like I did enough, then I'm like, oh, I'm not good enough. I should have done more, blah, blah, blah. Like very, very driven in that way. And just realizing like it's so ambiguous for me and like there, I should have one main overarching desire every day and that should be to please the Lord with what he's put before me and at the end of the day realizing like wow that is the best thing that i can do and so that's been super super helpful for me in readjusting my priorities november 2022 kristen and bethany released a video titled answering your questions about sex and intimacy why does it feel like most of their, an their content is just answering other people's questions about their personal lives very odd in this video, they really double down on the whole like, oh, we're real grown-ups who are actually giving you sex advice because now we had the sex and we're experts in it. <laughs> it also seems like this was around the time that Bethany finally learned for herself what an orgasm was. So that explains a lot, doesn't it? Hey, a lot of us have these questions. A lot of you are asking these, so let's talk about it. These don't need to be hush-hush. We can talk about this as Christian women. We don't have to be afraid and shy, like, ooh, sex. Like, we can go there. So let's jump in and answer some of your biggest hush-hush questions about sex. So the first hush-hush question about sex that we're going to answer, if a girl is going to be single for her whole life, does that mean she will never have sex at all? And I know this is a huge question single women have, like, okay, if I'm gonna be single forever, like, does this mean that I'm missing out on like the pinnacle of what it means to be a human? And sex has kind of become a god in our society, yeah. like in Christian like circles mm -hmm. and secular, because Christian circles, it's like, save yourself for marriage and then you will get married and ah, you know, like you will have sex and it's you the will best have thing reached ever. The, yeah, yeah. the pinnacle of your humanity. So Christians are not like they're kind of part of this problem of making sex literally like a god. But that was almost some self-awareness here almost it was so close but then they missed the mark once again by pushing for heavy constraints and rules and generally shaming anyone's sexuality for existing the reality is that yes if god has you single for your entire life he has also called you to a life of abstaining from sexual intimacy and that is a part of his plan it is a part of his design it's for our best for his glory you is asked is, is sex really as great as everyone says it is <laughs> That is such a fun Love question. The honesty in this question, because I remember thinking that when I was unmarried as well, had never had sex. And here's the deal. Sex is awesome. Like our culture does have that right. <laughs> the fact that it is truly amazing. But when it comes down to it, sex designed by God to be enjoyed as a celebration within the covenant of marriage. It is awesome, but it is also something that couples have to work at. Yeah. It's not just a boom, it's going to be like this most like sparks, fireworks, 4th of July, like every single day in your marriage. Like it is something like anything in marriage yes. where it is serving the other. It's pouring out when two people in a marriage are genuinely loving one another and, and enjoying sexual intimacy as they serve each other for the mutual pleasure and enjoyment of one another. It is truly a beautiful thing and it can be 4th yeah. of July, but it's not like that all the time. It was also around this time Bethany started posting a lot of sex-focused content on Instagram, so let's take a look at some of that. First up, we have this video where she really tells on herself and how for a long time as a woman, she thought you just kind of had to lie back during sex and let it happen. Let a man come to you and you just, you know, I want to say lie back and think of England, but she's American, so lie back and think of Texas. <laughs> When it comes to sex, this is a trap that I have heard many married women fall into, and me as well. I kind of had this idea when I got married that it was my husband's job to really bring me to life and excite me. And like, if I wasn't in the mood or feeling it, it's because he wasn't doing enough during the day or he wasn't really bringing me to life at night. And what I've realized, I haven't been married that long, but over the last four years is that I can't bring like, I call them dead bones, like dead bones to the bed. And then it's his job to like, okay, how are we going to bring her to life tonight? Like that is not how it works. And I've talked to other married women who experience this as well. What you have to do is you actually have to on your own, apart from him, like get yourself in the mood and excite like the eroticism within you before you ever get to the bedroom I mean that's something that lingerie can help with it's not so much for him it's for you as well to help you get excited to help you remember like hey I'm sexy and I have something to bring to this bedroom I don't know what do you think about this I do think it's great she's changing her stance on this now but 
Surely she can see that her content in the past has promoted this stuff. Surely she can look back and realize she's been part of the problem, can't she? She's been one of the people that has made women feel ashamed of their sexuality. She's been part of the problem in making women think sex is just something to be done to them, by men, for men. Without understanding that you were and are a part of the problem, content like this just kind of feels too little too late sometimes. In the next clip, she finally admits that she had no idea what she was doing when she first got married, despite all this time saying how she was totally prepared for it because she read like a whole bunch of Christian books. So again, nice to finally see a little bit of honesty from her. Have to comment for that. I knew exactly what to do, but in a much more real sense, I had no idea what to do. Then there's yet another clip about being afraid to talk to your partner about basic things, and Bethany uses this as an opportunity to sell her PDF with a bunch of questions for couples to ask each other. Now, maybe I shouldn't admit this, but I have not bought a copy of this PDF, but I have seen a version that was not entirely legally shared online. Um, I think someone posted photos of it on Reddit, and it's not great, I'll be honest. Have you ever felt like there are certain conversations or topics that are like off limits in your marriage? Um, I think a lot of us, even subconsciously, don't want to have certain conversations, don't want to approach certain topics because we're afraid of what we'll find out or we're afraid of what it will do to our relationship. And we feel like, okay, we're coasting, we're good, I don't want to stir the pot. When in reality, the deepest intimacy, the truest growth comes really when we go through the valleys, when we're put through the fire. And so instead of avoiding those hard conversations, avoiding those hard topics, we need to jump into them, we need to dive into them. And that may require doing that with a counselor, it may reveal we need counseling counseling in our relationship. But instead of being afraid of that, we should view that as a good thing. And that's actually one reason I created 150 questions to strengthen your marriage. But I don't know, this is where I'm kind of conflicted. On the one hand, I'm like, it's great that she's promoting good communication. I think good communication is important for every relationship. I think it's always good to work on that. But then again, I have to ask, well, if you can't communicate with your partner on basic things, why did you marry them? Then, in February of this year, 2023, Bethany went on the Heaven in Your Home podcast on the episode Before You Say I Do, and this podcast was revealing. This explained so much about Bethany's past, about who she is, who she was, where she came from, why she is the way she is. She revealed way more in this than I've, even heard, than I've ever heard from her before, which is saying a lot when you know how much Bethany shares about everything. So, this was very very revealing. It's very interesting. Meeting my husband and we were super, you know, public with our relationship and live streamed our wedding. And, oh, and then wow. I got this passion to like, I don't even know why, but to talk about like sex and intimacy. And I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. So I'm not coming at it from like the professional perspective, more of the like, let's just talk about this. So it's crazy looking back over the years, how things have changed and the topics change as you go through different seasons of life. So like you say, we don't blame our parents, anything like that. They were doing the best they can. I'm sure they had even less information from their parents, you know? Yes. So in some ways you're kind of trying to figure it out, but to be completely and totally honest, like this was definitely not a conversation that happened in our house. We didn't talk about anything from like natural girl functions like periods to definitely not to sex it was just like the body things that happen with that like not really happening we you know were very much about you know things like oh saving your first kiss for a marriage or you know purity things like that but in a very vague sense and so this is hilarious but the way that i actually even learned about what sex actually was like what was happening i did not even understand what it really was until i was probably like 20 and i was babysitting at somebody else's house and they had a children's book that oh was for my. kids explaining like what actually happened and i literally was like 20 when i finally realized like oh my goodness like body parts have to come together like a penis actually goes inside like whoa you know my mind was blown and hilariously enough my husband he was like 17 or 18 before he actually learned you know what like actual wow. intercourse was <laughs> and so that's kind of where I came from which I look back and I crack up I'm like you know I I wanted to know I wanted to understand more I didn't want to feel so much like disconnect and shame about my body even just like I said the natural functions of being a woman I just felt so embarrassed and so ashamed like this part to me is kind of insane. Now, 
I also come from a home where my parents didn't speak to me about anything like that. They didn't explain my period to me. They didn't tell me what sex was. They never sat me down to chat about safe sex or anything like that. So I can relate to that. I understand what that kind of household's like. The difference was I had a decent education or as decent as you can get in South Yorkshire. <laughs> Um, but one thing the UK does really well, I think, or at least they did back when I was at school, was good comprehensive sex education. And from a young age, they explained to us everything about how our bodies were working, what menstruation was, how it happens, why it happens, what to do when it happens. They gave us resources like free pads and stuff like that before most of us had started our periods to help us out. Um, the sex education they gave us was very comprehensive. They showed us how to put condoms on, everything like that. It was it was really, really good. And without that, maybe I'd have been in the same position as Bethany, but it makes me very, very mad at her parents because they decided to take her out of the public school system. They said, we are gonna be the ones solely responsible for your education. And then they didn't provide it. She had to be 20 years old and find this stuff out from a children's book. At 20 years old, I'd been working for six years and living by myself for two and a bit. And I'd been financially free from my parents for however many years it was. And like, I was off doing my own thing, living my own life. Meanwhile, she's having to find out from children's books that a penis goes in a vagina. That's terrifying. And obviously like some people, are great homeschoolers but I've made a comment before about like Kristen and Bethany not seeming to have had a good education and through homeschooling because of their parents and this really confirms it for me this is horrifying Bethany then goes on to talk about how she wants to reduce the shame around sex and like I say while she's clearly been part of the problem before I think this is probably when we really start to see her grow and change and even if she's not outwardly admitting that she's been part of a problem she is now admitting that there is a problem and she wants to be a part of the solution. So I do think we have to give her credit for this. Like crazy to talk about things, even mm -hmm. like a penis, you know, like I, that word was just like, oh my goodness, you know, like how can we be speaking this or like vagina, like, oh, you know, like this is so uncomfortable. And now it's like, I talk, you know, I have a son, I'm about to have a daughter and I have a husband and, you know, it's just like very, very normal now. I, I hardly knew anything and I had such high expectations and such like, I don't know. I, I just didn't understand mm -hmm. all that was to come. I remember on our honeymoon, we were reading one of these books mm -hmm. and we're just literally trying to figure out what the heck we're even doing. You know, like we're just having fun and trying to enjoy. And then we're reading these books that are saying like, here is like what sex should look like. Mm -hmm. And if you fall below this, something's wrong and you have a problem. And so I remember literally at one point we were staying in Colorado at this cute Airbnb and we were both like, you know, cause I'm like in tears now. I'm like, wow, we're just, we must be the only ones, everyone else, all these other newlywed couples are just crushing it and having like the best sex of their lives and their bodies do exactly what they want them to. You know, all the women are just immediately able to have orgasms and the husbands are just crushing it, doing exactly, they know exactly where to touch, exactly what, you know, all the things. And so I'm so discouraged. And so we were like, you know what? We're just gonna chuck this book. So we just like threw it away. This I found really interesting and revealing because I think this is the first time Bethany's openly admitted that Everything she said about her sex life and marriage in the last few years has mostly been a lie. All her stuff about, oh my god, the honeymoon was so wonderful, our intimacy is so wonderful, our sex life is so wonderful. Here she's finally admitting that it's a lie, and I think that's a really big step forward for her. That's really big progress, it really shows more maturity than she's ever displayed before, so again, I have to commend that. I was, you know, I was doing the stretches beforehand, I was really trying to prepare to make it not painful, and you know, I remember kind of dreading that, like, okay, the first time that penetration would happen, is it gonna just be like, what, what's gonna happen, you know? And so I just remember feeling so much relief when he actually like came inside of me for the first time. Like, I just felt like we had climbed Mount Everest, you it know, like, worked. we made it, you know, like, it worked, we can do this, you know, like, this oh. is incredible. And I know that's not everyone's experience. I know there are some who experience pain and a friend of mine actually, who she got married kind of around the same time, she was experiencing some pain, um, just needing to stretch more, but she didn't want to uh, communicate that to her new husband. And so she was saying it was terrible because the whole honeymoon, she's experiencing this pain, he has no idea. And so she was encouraging me 
like, you know, if you go on your honeymoon and you do, there are, there are those things that maybe you're like, Hey, could we try this? Or could we hold off on that? Or I, you know, I'm feeling this, um, just communicating those things to your new husband and just maybe even beforehand saying, Hey, let's just commit to like, you know, being, you know, being honest in these ways so that we can not feel alone if we are experiencing something difficult. And so that was really encouraging to me. And so I felt because of her story, a lot of freedom to communicate, you know, that to Dave. Again, this stuff about the importance of communicating here, really good. I think that's great. This might be way too, way too TMI, but I, you know, I, I was a, I was virgin on my wedding night. I, it was like my, you know, I was all the things like the first kiss, all the things. And when I saw my husband for the first time, honestly, my thought was like, oh my gosh, like, how's that ever going to fit inside of me? Like, it's massive, you know, like, how is that? But, you know, I'm like, I've put tampons out there, but this is like a whole new level, you know? And so honestly, I remember mentally being kind of like, how does this work? And so the fear of, I'm never going to be able to fit this thing inside of me. Like, no wonder there's pain. No wonder, you know? Yeah, this might be a bit too much information. I don't really want to hear about this. But again, this makes me wonder, what does Dave think about this? As in, what does Dave think about her sharing this? And then it ends with, again, actually great advice and a really nice sentiment. So yeah, I commend Bethany for that. It's just something I never thought I'd say. Just having that openness to communicate. If there is any pain, if there is any, you know, just knowing what will we do. So having a great mentor that you can call or having someone that you can communicate to about that and then just being able to communicate openly with your husband. I just hate the idea. I hate, hate, hate the idea of newlywed couples and one just like suffering alone, like one feeling something yeah. or hurting in some way and just feeling like I can't share share this with them. So this whole conversation is just absolutely crazy though. Bethany recognizes so many things that were damaging to her. She understands how they can be damaging to other people too. And yet in many ways she continues to perpe to perpetuate the cycle. And it kind of bothers me that she refuses to call her parents out for the harm they did to her. Now I know they're her parents. She loves them. She's still in a lot of contact with them, so I can understand why she's not but it's still a little frustrating to me. This podcast interview for me was really like proof of how far Bethany's come, but also how far she still has to go. After the podcast was released, there were still a ton more Instagram posts, including this one about people changing in marriage, which again, feels quite telling of her own experiences. The craziest part about marriage is that each person changes. The person you marry at the altar on your wedding day is not necessarily the person they're going to be a year from then, five years from that point, 10 years from that point, and same for you. I've heard a lot of married women say like, I already know my husband, I know everything there is to know about him, and I wanna challenge that. I think a lot of us think we know the ins and outs and the depths of our husbands, but the reality is, is that we're constantly changing, and so what might have been true about him a year ago could be completely different now. That's why I created 150 questions to strengthen your marriage, to really help you get to know the people that you are now, not to make assumptions, not to say, well, we just know everything about each other. So we don't really have anything to talk about. I, I know everything they think like, maybe that's not as true as you think. So if you're willing to be brave and explore the depths of your man's heart today, grab the marriage guide to help you in the process. Then there's a few I'm going to remove the audio from for copyright reasons, but this is where things start to get a bit bizarre and a lot of people started snarking on her because there's a lot of videos of her dancing while saying she's going to talk about sex, saying she wants to have sex, saying she's going to be sexy for her husband. It's a choice.
I guess her aim is to destigmatize the topic of sex in a fun way, but I'm not sure how successful she really is in achieving that goal through these kinds of videos. I think perhaps there are more effective ways. These kinds of videos are of course interspersed with skits about how miserable and unhappy her life is now. Again, it's a choice. And there are others about how her wedding day was literally the happiest day of her life and her absolute peak and she's been miserable since. So again, a choice. And then this was around the time she announced she was making a sex course for married women and started promoting the hell out of that. I've been going crazy working on this course, the ultimate sex course for women, and I have brought on the most incredible people, doctors, psychologists, sexologists, like so many people to help us as Christian women really understand how to thrive in this area of our marriage. The course is going to be absolutely incredible. Don't have sex, safe sex for marriage, wait, wait, wait. That's the message many of us heard growing up and then we get married and we're like, okay, so is this what I waited all this time for? Sex can be so difficult and beautiful and challenging and confusing all at the same time. And many of us just feel like, where do I go for answers? Like, where do I actually go for help? Unfortunately, in the Christian community, especially, there has been like a lot of silence around this issue, especially with women. And so a lot of married women feel like sex is more of a duty rather than a delight and something that they really look forward to. And especially when it comes to like the childbearing years and having young kids, it's like sex just seems like an extra burden rather than something that energizes and that you look forward to. And I want to change all of this. I want to help us as Christian women enjoy, delight, get excited about sex. And that's why I've created the ultimate sex course for Christian women. I've been married for four years and I have been passionate about the topics of sex and intimacy for a long time now. And since I got married, I've been so passionate about the topic of sex. There was just um, so much negativity even told to me about sex, specifically with women. So it kind of, this idea kind of came across like, sex is really a duty for the woman and like a delight for the man. And I just hated that because I was like, if we're constantly as women talking about how terrible sex is and how it's such a duty and you know, like our thoughts fuel how we feel. So like, that's not really gonna set yourself up for success. Please, this is quite interesting because her aim for this course, her talking about this whole mindset, this is something that so many of us have been trying to speak out about for such a long time now only to be shot down by people like Bethany before. We were told we were dirty sinners who were going to hell and wrong, wrong, wrong about everything, so shush. Yet now Bethany's realized that actually maybe they were a little more right and maybe this is what I should be promoting too, which is interesting. That said, I am dubious about Bethany herself making a sex course because it's Bethany. Let's be honest, I've been making YouTube videos for longer than Bethany Beale's been having sex. Never mind orgasms. Yeah, I don't feel qualified to call myself a YouTube expert and start making courses teaching other people how to get the best YouTube experience out there. So the fact that with less experience, she feels qualified to do that about something far more complicated and emotive, sex, is concerning to me. I think it's great she's learning and trying to make changes in her own life. And I think it's great that she's trying to make sure people aren't as uninformed as she was and is, but I don't think she's the right person to be making a course on this and charging so much money for something she still doesn't fully understand herself. But my worries aren't just around Bethany, they're around her experts as well. Now, I haven't looked into each and every one of these because honestly this video has already taken so much time to make, but to look at a couple of examples. Her lesson on sexual intimacy during infertility. Her expert talking about this is Morgan of the channel Paul and Morgan, a couple who are notorious for fighting on camera, being miserable with each other, Paul constantly shaming Morgan for having sex with one person years before they got married, Paul constantly moaning that they don't have enough sex, and Morgan moaning that Paul wants to have sex with her at all and seeming completely disgusted by the idea of sex in general. There have been times when I've done something or said something to Morgan that's been so hurtful and in the back of my mind, I'm like, oh, it's nice knowing, it's nice knowing that she can't go anywhere. <laughs> okay, that doesn't give you the right to say mean things I to your wife. I feel guilty about it. The first thing I knew about, uh, I wish I had known about sex, was this. Okay. Don't expect your sex, once you get married, 
to don't expect the, the sexiness and the adventuresome crazy awesome stuff to go from zero to 100 right out of the gate realize that is going to take some time and if i had realized that before getting married i wouldn't have brought out the whipped cream on <laughs> on our honeymoon it was a bad idea it made morgan cry but in all reality in my mind it was i'm finally married now i welcome everything in the kitchen sink into our sex life let's go wild and morgan's like i'm like bro i barely know you there are times when either paul and i are maybe even making a video or talking to one another or another couple and like we're like oh our sex how's our sex life doing i'm like it's great and paul's like well it's good but and i'm like wait what i thought we were good i thought we were on the same page <laughs> when you so. think you've communicated enough communicate more yes so that really is just huge 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 you guys uh you don't wake up every morning oh kissy kissy no okay i wish we did and you don't fall asleep all god love you a little bit no i wish we did i'd like to go to bed snuggling we do okay no 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 we're not putting this in the video we need to work on this Alright, I hear what you're saying. Just move on to something else. <sighs> you just act like I never give you any love here. <laughs> it's fine, it's fine. We need to move on. It's fine. We did not literally find any hope closure to that little scenario. For years, Paul and Morgan followed really, really harmful Christian advice, which actually made their infertility a lot worse. And it was only once they stopped doing that and saw a secular fertility expert, they actually managed to get pregnant. They have so many personal intimacy issues and so many fertility issues that asking Morgan, who is still struggling with all this stuff, to be an expert on intimacy during infertility just it seems like the worst idea ever, I'll be honest. Is it possible to keep the spark alive when you are struggling with infertility? Let's ask Morgan. Okay, let me be honest. The answer is yes, but it's not easy. And it's gonna take a lot of intentionality. You know, I can't remember how many times before being intimate with Paul, I had to pray to the Lord, Lord, let me just have fun. Help me just have a fun, beautiful time with my husband and not be so focused on, I really hope this makes a baby. Um, it's not easy, you guys. So don't be afraid to invite the Lord into your intimate sessions and times with your husband. And as easy as it is to say and as hard as it is to implement, try your best to give control over to the lord and trust that in his perfect timing a baby will come and if that doesn't happen that he will provide that deep desire fulfill that deep desire of wanting children of being a mother in a whole different beautiful way but all in all yes it's possible go have fun to look at another example and honestly i would say this one is even worse <sighs> In lesson number five, the path towards a spicy bedroom, this is co-taught by experts Glenn and Phyllis Hill. Now for one, I wouldn't want Bethany teaching about spicy bedrooms for two reasons. One, because she unironically uses the word spicy, and two, because her idea of hot and sexy is this. But the main issue with this comes from Glenn and Phyllis themselves. Now you might be wondering, who the hell are they? It's look like a random couple, right? Well, here are some clips from an interview that Bethany recorded with them and then quickly deleted when she realized how much backlash she was getting for the things they were saying. Basically, and you'll see this towards the end of the clips and warning now, 
They basically admitted to assaulting their child in order to use her as an anatomical model to figure out where the clitoris was. This woman genuinely thought for the first like however many years of marriage, like years and years and years and years that she didn't have a clitoris and didn't understand where it was. So instead of opening up a textbook, they got their newborn baby daughter, looked at her genitalia and tried to find the clitoris on her to see if it existed. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that's probably sexual assault. It makes me very, very uncomfortable. It's wrong, it's dangerous, they shouldn't be doing this. And people like this absolutely shouldn't be teaching a course on spicy sex. Listen to the rest of these clips. They're, oh, God's sake, I wouldn't trust them on anything. I do have to thank this user on Reddit for re-uploading these clips because Bethany did remove the video from her channel and I couldn't find another copy anywhere else. And I also have to thank Hemant Meta, who goes by the Friendly Atheist, for uploading this other clip to his Twitter account. And also just, a general thank you to Hemant actually. He really helped me out when I first started my channel all those years ago. He was supportive, he helped me get the microphone I still use today, um, he shared around some videos. He was absolutely wonderful and I wouldn't be where I am without him today, so I do have to thank him for that. Wonderful man. All are an incredible couple and I'm just excited for the entire Girl Define community to get to know you. I hope that y'all become like the, you know, the mentor couple of this community because we need it and we need godly marriages to look up to. We come from conservative uh, Christian okay. background, uh, very much during a time when purity culture was all that was talked about. So we kind of understood what not to do. We went mm -hmm. into marriage thinking we're set up. We have nailed this. We love God with a passion. We were deeply involved mm -hmm. in church and ministry. Uh, we read scripture all the time together. We prayed together mm -hmm. uh, continuously. So we knew that mm -hmm. this was pretty much a slam dunk. We're on point <laughs> and it's going to be uh, phenomenal. Uh, we were a little bit wow. shocked. That it didn't mm -hmm. play out so you get married, you go into your honeymoon, you have the slam dunk ready, which I can kind of relate to. That's kind of how I felt when I got married. Like, I have read the books. I've got this. Like, I am a pro. With the whole idea of purity, that we mm -hmm. thought our first sexual encounter would be spiritual, would be like beyond um, any joy experience in our lives. Mm -hmm. And it was really just the opposite for me. And for me, it was the greatest 11 seconds of my <laughs> life. So. And I was shocked at how ungrateful my new wife was. I was like, what? That was a big win. But I had no idea. Because, I mean, literally for me, you know, we have penetration for the first time. And there you go. I ejaculated. And wow, what a yeah. huge yeah. win. And I did not know that my partner mm -hmm. was like, wait, what? That, that, yeah. that was the magic? Are you kidding me? <laughs> I would learned quite a bit about sex from my fellow third graders. And I uh, found out that some of that information was inaccurate. Who knew? Uh, and I had never told Phyllis that I knew everything about sex, but I hadn't told her that I didn't. Neither of us were prepared mm. for the disappointment, for the trauma. Like there was, yeah. for me, it the whole experience, and I didn't have a voice. To, I didn't know how to communicate what was happening for yeah. me. And so I was just very quiet and, you know, uh, Water skiing felt safe. So that's, and I knew how to water ski. So that was a yeah. comfortable place for me. Glenn had, uh, he had booked this honeymoon place that was like an actual honeymoon resort. Mm -hmm. And everything was like red velvet and mirrors, you know, yes. mirrors everywhere. And I was just mortified mm -hmm. because I wasn't comfortable with mm -hmm. any of it. Like it just, it went from zero to a hundred way too quickly mm -hmm. for me. It didn't feel right but I didn't know how to say right. that. And I didn't know how to communicate my pain in it. Glenn was just so confused. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so he experienced tons of pain on our honeymoon because of the way I was reacting to everything. And so we made a lot of bad conclusions. I mean, mm -hmm. it didn't take long for us to actually just decide that I was broken. And wow. I accepted that. I'm like, yep, you're right. I'm one of those broken people who, and know, broken because you. you were, because you say broken, what do you, yeah. Because I, I was so sexually activated, which is the typical male or the vast, yeah. vast majority. It's not a hundred percent, but it's pretty close. 
Um, so I was sexually activated far more readily and far more frequently than she was. Got it. So mm-hmm. obviously she was broken because she was never, I don't mm-hmm. like to say never with yeah. human behavior, but she was never sexually activated. So yeah. obviously she's damaged. She's broken mm-hmm. and there's just something mm-hmm. uh, wrong with her. And again, I was not the voice saying that, but I didn't yeah. say otherwise. And so we just kind of accepted, well, too bad. You know, this poor woman mm. happens to be broken and this poor guy happens to be married to a broken woman. I understood enough to know that this was my duty. This mm. was my wifely yeah. duty. So it didn't matter if I liked it or didn't like it or that I felt pain. For me, it's like this do- This is what marriage is now. Like I would say all the oh. fun we had dating all of a sudden didn't exist anymore. I was trying to survive and I was trying to um, avoid as much as possible sex. And so I was always yeah. running, you know, running away from him. Me, I felt yeah. like I couldn't win. Sex was painful as in emotionally yeah. painful. It was confusing for me. It was easier for me just to conclude I'm broken. So mm-hmm. sorry, buddy. That's what you got. Yeah. And, you know, I yes. did the mandatory number of times sex in a month, whatever that yeah. was, but there was not pleasure in it for well, me. And I didn't actually think there was pleasure in it for any women. This is just a wifely duty thing. And yeah. um, there's no one out there having fun in this arena. Mm. And so that's kind of how we functioned. Like I was like, yeah, I'm broken. Like I didn't even think wow. that that was a weird sentence. But she said, okay, what, can you define broken? What, what are you saying? What yeah. does that mean? And, and then I just said, oh, well, I don't have a clitoris. Um, Cause at this point, mm. Glenn had read enough to know that a clitoris was involved and um, yeah. didn't know where it was, but knew that that mattered and that had to do with yeah. an orgasm. And it's like, yeah, I, I've never orgasmed and there's no pleasure. I don't enjoy it. Matter of fact, I hate it. Wow. I just endure it. We just get through it as fast as possible. And, um, and so, yeah, we shared that openly and she wow. was in the medical field and, uh, she was like, okay, whoa, well, what do you mean? You don't have a clitoris. And our friend after a, a bit said, you know, I, I just feel like taking Phyllis in the back room and showing her what I'm talking about. Mm. Well, Phyllis started to stand up. Mm. Uh, and then this other woman said, but I just can't. I can't do that. Our oldest child had been born, uh, which is a little girl. And eventually, uh, Phyllis was changing uh, our daughter's diaper, and uh, our friend Mm. showed her uh, on um, our little girl, you know, where the clitoris is located, which was huge information Mm -hmm. uh, for Phyllis. And and again, it's stunning to me. That's pretty darn basic. Mm -hmm. And we're smart people, and we were clueless. (laughs) So yeah, I'm sorry, but these are not the kinds of people who should be touted as experts or teaching a course on healthy sex lives. These kinds of people are going to cause far more harm than good. Anyway, around the time Bethany was first promoting her sex course on Instagram and everywhere else, this interestingly was also when her husband Dave put out quite a concerning Instagram video and then follow it up with a number of other concerning live streams. People were worried about him, but also this was the first time they'd finally seen him open and honest and really genuinely real about everything that had been going on behind the scenes for all these years. Dave, it turns out, had actually been pretty miserable. He'd been having suicidal ideation at some point. It's crazy, but take care when you listen to these clips because they are, they are difficult to watch and yeah, it makes me feel for Dave. I just turned 29. I am a motion designer. I'm an amateur musician. I'm a husband. I'm a father. And about a year ago, I realized I didn't like my life and I didn't like myself. When I left home at the age of 20, all I wanted was to be liked, to be appreciated, to have attractive people think that I'm attractive. And so I spent about nine years of my life chasing that. Three years into my marriage, and I'm miserable. I blamed my wife. It wasn't her fault. I blamed my parents, of course, it wasn't their fault. There was really only one answer. I had driven myself to deny my integrity and hide my flaws because anything that threatened people's approval in my life had to go. I was choosing to be a coward and deep down I knew it. I was suppressing my life energy by adapting myself to what I thought other people wanted from me. I was emotionally manipulative and controlling in my marriage 
and ultimately ineffective and undesirable. So I've been making some changes. For the past six months or so, I've been confronting myself in various areas of my life and I've realized something. Living my life for the approval of other people is a ridiculous waste. So that means I have to actually build a life. That's what I'm working on. One thing I do find a little concerning is that like, Dave was posting stuff like this on Instagram at the same time as Bethany was posting stuff like this. what comes to mind? Is it duty? Is it dread? Is it uh, just something I have to check off the list? Is it uh, my husband wants so much sex? Or maybe is it on the other side, like something that you're really excited about and something that you look forward to and something that you pursue throughout the day? I mean, what comes to your mind when you hear the word sex? Way too many of us as women just kind of get into a rut and we get into this groove and it's like, eh, sex is okay, or maybe it's like really not great at all, but we just kind of settle and we're like, okay, I guess this is just my lot in life. I guess this is just what, what sex is gonna look like for me. Like, no, we are going to break that down because that is just not true, okay? Sex can be so much better, so much more fulfilling, so much more amazing to where you are the one that's chasing your husband around the house saying, I want sex, this is so amazing for me. Like, I feel so excited and rejuvenated and like, ah, oh, yes, I want this. That can be you. I like, did, did she not care? Did she still think that was appropriate? I don't know. But this is a very different Dave to what we've seen before. I didn't like my life and I didn't like myself. Three years into my marriage and I'm miserable. I blamed my wife. So you can't hear clips like this and not assume that all the girl-defined con content probably made it worse, can you? Bethany literally put him online in front of hundreds of thousands of people and made their whole brand together being the perfect couple. And when things weren't perfect, it must have caused him so much pain and stress and uncertainty and fear. And in that respect, I do feel quite sorry for them both. And really started to realize that I structured my life in a way that was so... Uh, other oriented, I would say. It's where you basically make people and their approval the center of your life. And then you, uh, you say yes or no to things depending on how much you think saying yes or no will shake up or stabilize those people around which you have chosen to orbit your life. So, um, the problem is we can't control those people. I never could control my wife or my friends. I couldn't control what they thought of me, much less anything else about them. So what that means is you end up basically a no self. Like you have no identity. All you all you have is just what other people, the reflection that you're getting back from other people. And that's, um, it turns out that that's a very um, difficult way to live. It turns out that it's very um, resentment prone. If you, if you build your life around getting the reflected sense of yourself from other people, then resentment will probably be skyrocketing because, uh, you always offload responsibility onto other people. So if I build my life around Bethany, for example, in a way that emotionally I'm orbiting her and trying to uh, make sure that she's happy all the time, um, what that means is that every decision I make, I have the potential to offload onto her and sort of blame her for the consequences rather than taking responsibility for myself and my own decisions. And um, so, for example, 
if one day Bethany is uh, in a bad mood, has a bad day, and I um, try to do things to make her happy so that she won't be in a bad mood. Uh, before, I would often do that, but with a bunch of strings attached to now, once I do this nice thing for her, now she has to be really nice to me. And uh, she has to basically have the mood that I've paid for. <laughs> so, <laughs> if you're having a bad mood, and I'm going to pay, I'm going to do this action not out of unconditional love. I'm going to do it as a quid pro quo. I do, I do this action. I wash the dishes or I take care of the kids or whatever. And then you won't be in a bad mood, right? And then you'll like me, right? And then we'll have a good you know, relationship, right? Bethany and I would have these conversations. And they would be so devastating to me. <laughs> uh, she would express something she didn't like, for example. And a lot of these conversations had to do, interestingly enough, with <clears throat> her with celebration. And uh, with the fact that I wasn't, you know, sort of celebrating her um, accomplishments and achievements in a way that was, that would have, that she would have thought was loving. I think again, without wanting to comment too much on the specifics of someone else's marriage, that again, we're only seeing from the outside. I think that maybe, especially this admission towards the end here of him like not celebrating Bethany's accomplishments, I'd say that maybe this explains why she's always looked for so much external validation online. Maybe this is why she's so chronically online. This is maybe why she posts so much to Instagram and she flips between different eras, you know, with her girl boss era and now her sexpert era and all this sort of thing. And it's interesting. Hopefully now that Dave is learning a little bit and they're working on their communication a bit more and they're figuring out some stuff in their marriage, maybe she'll not need the online validation as much. It'll be interesting to see what happens over the next few years, you know? To alleviate the tension in our relationship, I would take on basically the weight and the blame of everything in the conversation. So she said, you know, you did this to me, uh, or you, you know, you're uncaring or something like that. And I would basically get to this point in the conversation after arguing for a while or after trying to reason, uh, I would get to this point of being like, you're right. I'm the most selfish. Because I could kind of strain to see it from her point of view and, and be like, okay, she's, you know, she thinks I'm selfish. So I'm going to basically admit, you know, I'm the most selfish. I have all of these problems, right? And uh, <laughs> what it, it, those conversations would end up being devastating for me. And I didn't really know any other way. So the only way out of those very intense conversations was that I, that I knew or that I chose was to basically take on the blame of everything. And, and then it got kind of started to get worse. And I started to have these suicidal fantasies. <laughs> so they call it passive suicidal ideation, where you're not really about to end your life, but you are fantasizing about it. And I like the word fantasy because my fantasy had to do not really with me being so, uh, feeling so worthless necessarily. That, that probably was in there somewhere. But what made my fantasy compelling was how bad Bethany would feel if, uh, if I were no longer here. And, um, and that I had some moments where the, those suicidal fantasies were more dramatic and that's when I basically decided I need to do something about this. This, this in particular, was really awful to listen to and kind of difficult. And I don't know, again, it feels like we shouldn't be listening to this stuff. It feels too private and personal and it's weird. It feels like in some ways we're watching like a faux sham of a marriage implode in real time except one half is being honest about it imploding and the other's like, ha ha ha, let me tell you how to have great sex, pay me money for it. Very bizarre. 
But after releasing this video, everyone was very, very worried about Dave and he realized this and he was like, oh crap, maybe I should make things a little clearer, issue sh some corrections and that sort of thing. So he then did another live stream um, because he realized that he'd completely shattered Bethany's carefully curated image of their perfect marriage and he needed to do a bit of damage control. I think there is a misconception and I can take responsibility for not quite communicating in a way that gave the fullest picture, but I think there's a misconception that um, what I shared about having suicidal ideation, about difficulty um, managing my sense of self, a lot of that stuff, that was, um, it wasn't brought about by Bethany. I just want to make that very, very clear because I think there's a sense, a lot, a lot of times we, uh, um, it's easy to view relationships as sort of having a hierarchy, like there's a victim and a victimizer, right? And while that holds true and is probably the closest and best interpretation for many relationships, it certainly, in my opinion, does not hold true for all relationships. I had suicidal ideation before I got married to Bethany. I had, um, at various points in my life, going all the way back to childhood, I would fantasize leaving home. So that was sort of the level I was at, probably talking like 12, 13 year old era. And I would fantasize, you know, what if I, if I left home, if I ran away from home. And again, same type of uh, situation where uh, the fantasy had to do with how bad people would feel if I was no longer there. So this, this type of um, internalized, um, processing in this unhealthy way was I had a pattern of that. Uh, I went through therapy uh, officially last year. So that would have been between the months of about February and August, September, thereabouts. So I think it was roughly eight months uh, that I was in therapy and counseling. This was good to hear. I'm glad he's getting actual therapy and not just like biblical counselling. I think this is real positive. Great. Then finally on April 12th, which, oh, the day after my birthday, Bethany decided she needed to make their marriage problems even more public. So not only would Dave be talking about them on his personal Instagram, Instagram account with two or so thousand people, but Bethany needed him to talk about it in front of all 159,000 Girl Defined subscribers in the video, our most open marriage conversation yet with Dave and Bethany. Now, I was quite cynical when I started watching this, but honestly, after seeing this video and the Instagram live they did, I actually think Bethany's showing a lot of progress and maturity. So while it's not perfect, I think this is actually a positive step forward for all my snarkiness. I do, I do think there's some good that comes of this. So yeah, they open by actually being really real and honest for once. Four years married, I would say we have grown and changed a lot in the last four years. Um, so maybe let's start by just giving like, the I don't know, six months. <laughs> the last six months. Um, I don't know, like a little recap of why, why we think we've changed so much. I don't know. You go for it. Well, uh, <laughs> I think that a lot of things have changed more recently, like in the last six months. Yeah, that's true. Um, I'll just speak personally. I got to a point basically four years into our marriage where I just kind of hit a big wall of disappointment and um, went to get counseling. Mostly, mostly thinking you should get counseling. I was mostly thinking really Bethany should get counseling, uh, but I'm going to lead in this and make it about me and my issues. And it turned out to be a lot about me and my issues. And then there's this revelation. But then I did go get counseling. But too. then you did go get counseling. She did go get counseling. Yeah. So, you know, it all, multiple different levels of how that worked out. Yeah. Dave then talks about specifically how and why Bethany presented this fake we're so happy front. And it seems like maybe she wasn't just doing it because it was her brand and 
her image and for the publicity and stuff. But it seems like maybe she genuinely wanted to believe it herself and she figured that the longer she pretended, the more real it might become. So this kind of made me feel a bit sorry for her. She yeah. definitely presented a more optimistic picture. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that in some ways you have thought more optimistically or if even if I were to ask, you would say you were happy. Yeah. I was miserable. I think you were you were calling. You were like, I just don't know. I can't really make you happy. And, you know, I'm pretty happy. That's more yeah, what yeah, you were yeah, saying yeah, at yeah. the time. Yeah. Um, but I was pretty miserable for good reason. Uh, my biggest problem was not what I wasn't getting out of our relationship. It was what I was bringing to our relationship mm. and what I was capable of in our relationship, which was very underdeveloped and very low. Dave then says he wants to do marriage counseling and see a sex therapist too. And Bethany chimes in with this, which bothered me a little. I think everyone, I think every married couple should get marriage counseling, individual counseling and see a sex therapist. Like that's my personal opinion. I particularly opinion. need it. It's interesting because like, I agree with counseling being able to help everyone at some point in their life, but I'm not sure every couple needs to see a sex therapist. I think that might be a bit far. I think plenty of people have perfectly healthy and fulfilling sex lives without the need of a therapist. And I think Bethany's idea of like, oh, well, now we're finally admitting that we have sex problems. I'm going to assume everyone has sex problems and it's normal and everyone has the problems we do. When in reality, that's not really the case. And it feels like maybe she's projecting a little to protect her ego, perhaps. You know, there is so much more to marriage and so much like joy and excitement and life to be had and I think a lot of us just settle because we are like well this is just the way it is this is just us as a couple or whatever. Then they start answering audience audience questions again and the first one interestingly is something I brought up repeatedly in this video. It does it bother Dave that you talk so openly about sex online? Uh, the answer is yes but in a good way. Um, so I am proud of how open and honest Bethany is about sex, how more, how she's owning her sexuality herself and uh, rather than expecting or requiring somebody to give her something in order for yeah. her to be sexually fulfilled. Um, but because Bethany does talk a good bit about sex, um, it indirectly does reflect on me in our sexual relationship and it challenges my needy desire to be thought of as competent and strong. Um, so something she says could expose me as sexually inadequate uh, or, or cause people to question like, oh, what kind of a sex life do they have? Um, you know, how good is he in bed? Um, you know, does he even uh, have what it takes. You know, all of those things that I would question about myself. I find his answer concerning, but I'm not quite sure how to address it. I don't know, let, let me know your thoughts on this in particular down in the comments, because I'd be interested to know how you guys interpret his answer here. Again, the next point Bethany makes here is very, very interesting. I mean, the reason I talk about sex online is because of, um, like, my desire for other women to know like there are more like we all have questions we all have um areas where we feel like we're not good at or we struggle in and like i said sometimes in the christian world it can be um like yes you just need to serve each other and that's where the best sex comes from or whatever like being you know whatever um there can be like these oh. basic these basic terms and you're like well we have like physically more struggles or we haven't been able to like achieve something or we're like not connecting, even though we're like going through the motions and we need help with that. And so I never claim to be a sex expert. I am very open that we're learning and growing. And that's why I'm constantly recommending resources and pointing you to people that I trust, that I've learned from that. So as I've said throughout this whole video, I think, I do think it's great she's trying to destigmatize sex. But this idea that sex is about serving each other is literally what she's been saying for years. Look back at the clips of her and Kristen basically saying, to prepare yourself for marriage, you just have to get in that servant's mindset. Just think about serving your husband. 
they literally, literally said these exact things. So instead, I started developing a really positive, beautiful, Christ-centered, servant-hearted uh, mindset about sex and about intimacy. And they're not acknowledging it now. She's not acknowledging it now. So I'm conflicted. On the one hand, it's nice to see her finally grow and mature and be putting out some slightly more helpful content. But on the other, I still don't think she realizes how much she has been a part of the problem for these last few years and actively needs to work to fix that. This video goes on and Honestly, I'm starting to get a little bit exhausted by this point. There's some stuff about them not really learning how to deal with conflict from their families and stuff like that. And then they decided to have another conversation like this, but this time on an Instagram live stream. This one's interesting because again, it kind of feels like it should be happening in private, but this Instagram video surprised me because this is the most genuine I have ever, ever seen them. And I do respect them for that. They actually come across as quite likable in this video I found. I was shocked with myself and um, Dave talks about how he finds the Q&A format a little stifling sometimes and then when they're asked about how many kids they want instead of giving the typical oh god commands is to give her demons play kind of spiel we get a genuine answer from them listen to this I hope to you know what I kind of want to break I'm just being honest with you you know it's just <laughs> hard <laughs> My, my feelings are, are multiple. So on the one hand, I, I love kids and I love the ones we have yeah. for sure. And um, hard to imagine life without them and I'm, they're, they're great. Yeah. But in the future, moving forward, um, you know, it's just like a year, it's like a year and a half of your life and everything is different. And you know, we've been trying to work on a lot of things together as a couple and it does, I think even though the babies, having the babies that bring up a lot of really great things to work on, I also think that, you know, it's difficult to find the time. I really, so, you know, it'd be nice to maybe have like a, a year or two between the yeah. next pregnancy, if, if that exists. I much prefer this genuine side to them instead of this like, faux, positive, oh my god, we're so perfect and happy together because we did it in the right way. Instead of that, you know? Like after this, Bethany goes on to talk about aging and miscarriages and it's all very real. And I do genuinely think this stuff is far more helpful to her audience than any of the like, oh my god, so my wedding night was so perfect, right? And ha, 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 perfect. This, this stuff, way more helpful to people. Dave then actually talks about how saving himself for marriage wasn't this beautiful, perfect, holy thing they've always made it out to be. Remember that clip from earlier about zero regrets, no, blah, blah, blah. It actually gives us more freedom to have constraints. The reality is freedom can only be experienced within proper constraints. Absolutely, and I've, worth it? I mean, yes, absolutely worth it. It's, well, I've experienced, we've experienced so much value yeah. in, in our sexual relationship. No, he tells us the truth in this clip. He uses words like anxiety and guilt a lot, and again, really respect the honesty for once. Did you have fun sexually before marriage, even though you saved yourself for it? For it. <laughs> what does that mean? Did you have fun sexually? I mostly was tortured sexually. <laughs> what does that mean? It's so like full of, full of anxiety and and repre and guilt and all that. Okay, well, um, I, I was constantly worried about breaking, crossing boundaries. I was constantly worried about losing control of myself. Everyone losing their minds! I was, I was so worried. I've been told and kind of received an idea that that's what will happen to you. Like, get in this moment, and then you're going to lose your freaking brains, and then you're going to regret it for the rest of your life. And it never, that never happened. And I felt, I, we were in, we would be in moments and you would be, I would, I'd be thinking like, if I cross the line right now, I think, I think I might be able to get away with it. And then I was like, but I'm not gonna. Cause I was like this. Oh. But then I was constantly like, I would go home. I would go home and I would just be like, did I cross a line? Did I, did I do something I shouldn't have done? I would just so much. It was ridiculous. Ridiculous. So what would you do differently if you went back in time? 
If I went back in time? Yeah. I would say, get it together, man! <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 um, I don't think I would have made nearly as big a deal about it. You made a bigger deal of it. Like, he, you were the one, we were holding hands, and you were like, I don't want to do that until we get engaged. Okay. Okay. Well, let's expand on that. <laughs> you, that is fair enough. I was more strict. Yeah. But strict. my boundaries were completely arbitrary. And like, I don't, I don't know what boundaries I'm supposed to have. So I'm like going to pick all these boundaries. So I picked these really strict boundaries and then I would hold to them really strictly. Very strict. And then, and you know, just like, cause we need boundaries, I guess. And Bethany would have more, um, like internal, like, I don't feel like, I feel like this is the line or I feel like that's the line. And so that for you, for you, it was much more clear and you know, when you're crossing your lines and stuff. And I'm always like, I was just a lot more. Yeah. relative about it and just like well then you have to just pick yeah. one and it was uh yeah. it was just you know i had a really hard time understanding the difference between like sexual desire and sin sexual yeah desire, that and was it. And i just yeah i mean is that the purity movement i don't yeah. i don't i didn't really grow up in the proper like the purity movement but um I think I had just a lot of totally. that influence on from where I came from. So. Yeah. Because it's so much, it's like, you're supposed to be attracted to this person, but like not too much, or you're not supposed to, it's just, I was so confused. Yeah. And the people we would talk to that were pretty conservative, they seemed to have it all worked out. It's so refreshing to see someone call out the, and again, men are just animals who can't help themselves, side of purity culture for the crap that it is. There's also what seems like a really great moment where, I would say this is the most thoughtful and caring behavior I've seen Bethany display on camera, which may be a low bar, but honestly, I'm impressed with her for this. She asked Dave if she can share a story about something that happened between them. She whispers to him which one it is, he says no, and then she doesn't do it. She's just like, oh, okay, no worries, and then moves on. That's really mature for Bethany. That's really selfless for her. Like, genuinely, I'm impressed. Well, one that we could probably share. This is probably about the real. I no. No. Okay. Yeah. I, that's why I asked. Are they that special? I don't know. <laughs> I was gonna share an example, but no. We'll skip it. Okay. In a yeah, in another huge moment of growth, she talks about not enforcing dating bound dating boundaries on other people. That's an entirely different perspective that we've not heard from her before. Well, I think the Bible's clear on stuff. Like, I think it's clear that, like, sex should be reserved for marriage. It's different than saying, yeah. thou shalt date thus and such. No, I know, but it, then it's hard because it's like everyone has to come up with a... They have to come up with boundaries, they have to come up with a way to live, they have to come up with something, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like, we all have to come up with something mm -hmm. outside of the black and white, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So it's just not enforcing that on other people, I think is the, the biggie. Or not to do. And you're like, this is the, this is the best and nay, the only way to fulfill this direction. <laughs> Crazy. This is such a different and better Bethany. She's still not completely judgment free. I'm not saying, oh my God, she's great. Everyone should go listen to her now. I'm not saying that at all, but I am saying she's showing some growth in a positive direction. Dave literally makes a joke about like how strict she's been with other people in the past and they can laugh about it together and I think that's really great to see. Dave then goes on to talk about how they absolutely lied and faked in the past about what their sex life was like and how it was actually pretty awful and now they're able to be more honest about it being bad with both the public and each other and they're actually seeing improvements which again is nice and helpful to their audience you know. But you know one of the best things about what we're doing now we're probably more limited than we've ever been. I know, which is crazy. But what we do have has improved a lot compared to what we did have. Our, like our intimacy. Our, our sex Not life. like <laughs> Our intimacy. It, it, um, and, and I don't, it doesn't need to be detailed, but it just is, it's a lot more honest. And before, like what, one of the things that I would do was like, if I had a problem with something, I would just basically try to bottle it up, keep it inside, yeah. and like ex, ex, um, express like positivity. You know, you, you know, this is great or whatever, and then just be like, 
it would just be like we could have the crumbs, just the, the bare crumbs of of love and intimacy on <laughs> for both of us, and then just be like pretending like that 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 that's that's great. This is so great. It's not. It's really really not. So when things get cut short or you know the baby's waking up and stuff. Um, uh, we're both a lot more comfortable being like, that sucks, this yeah. sucks, I don't like this. Then there's another really nice moment where Dave's gone out the room to sort out their other kid and Bethany's been, been really open and honest about how pregnancy's affected her body. And when Dave comes back into the room, he genuinely asks her like, how are you doing postpartum? You, you all right? Like, and he checks in on her. And it's really nice to see them both communicating in a very real way. Like, I actually found myself, and I'm shocked I'm saying this, I found myself enjoying moments of this live stream because it was nice just watching them interact with each other and have a giggle together and care about each other. I've never seen that side of them before this. So I think this is really, real progress that um pregnancy is a lot and so making sure that you're doing everything you can to like support your body so that you have that natural ability to get excited how there. are you doing postpartum way better than i was with davy yeah so sweet you're good yeah postpartum with davy was really hard that was probably the hardest time in our both of our lives as a married couple <sighs> Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. It was really, really, really difficult. He was just a really unhappy baby and breastfeeding was really hard and we just weren't sleeping at all. And it was just really, really, really hard. We were newer in our relationship. Everything was just difficult. And that's the end of the saga of Bethany Beale up until today. I'm sure it will continue on in the future. To conclude, I have so many thoughts. Oh my God. Bethany and Dave are clearly still problematic, we can't deny that, but they are learning, and they are growing, and they are changing, and I think we do need to give them some credit for that. I also think the things that we've learned about their childhood, even if they don't want to admit there was that much wrong, definitely explain why they have some of the issues that they do, and while it doesn't excuse their behaviour, it does help explain it. Dave's use of therapy to work through these issues that he clearly recognizes he has are really commendable. Um, his going to therapy at all is commendable. Bethany's insistence that her parents were still great, despite them, you know, not letting her go to a real school and yet never giving her an education themselves, is concerning. Also, the fact that instead of going to real therapy, she's seeing a free biblical counselor is again concerning and we do have to question their credentials a little bit so that's worrying but it does seem like she's making progress and it does seem like she is getting better in a lot of areas and that is something to commend and I think that's great. There are obviously still a lot of issues with what they're teaching but it's nice to see them kind of backtracking on some, at least some, of the harmful things they've tried to teach before. Now, of course, we can't deny the harm they've caused and continue to harm in other areas. We have to be completely honest and say these people, especially Bethany, I can't speak for Dave, but Bethany at least is still homophobic, is still transphobic, is still related to Nazis and celebrates them for some reason. There's still issues there and while they're showing progress in many areas, they clearly haven't shown progress in those areas, so we have to be aware of that. It's hard to find a balance between the kind of like wanting to positively reinforce the good changes while not condoning the still really bad harmful stuff they're doing you know i'm not going to sit here and be like oh my god i love bethany bill she's so great because ultimately she's still homophobic and transphobic and i can't support someone like that but it's nice to see her making some steps and i don't want to just like ignore them and pretend that people can never change or grow or get better because that's not the case. I think celebrating even the little steps is the way she's gonna improve more and more in the future. So would I recommend you buy Bethany Beale's sex course? No, not at all. What do I think will happen with their marriage in the future? Oh, I honestly have no idea, you know? But I do hope that they can continue to learn and grow and enjoy each other's company. I hope they become better people. And as much as I'm snarky sometimes, I really don't wish them any ill will. 
not at all. One thing I found while making this video, and this has been a very long video to make, oh my god, the amount of work I've done for it is insane. The amount of videos I've had to watch, podcasts I've had to listen to, Instagram accounts I've had to scroll through, live streams I've sat through for hours and hours and hours and hours, it has been exhausting. But one thing I found which has really surprised me is that, as I said in the beginning, I feel like I started off this video being really snarky and being like, ugh, girl they're fine, let's just like totally have a giggle at them again. And yet now I'm at a point where I actually feel a lot more sympathy for Dave and Bethany. We've always speculated about their past and what Bethany's childhood was like and what her parents were like and that sort of thing, but now we know for sure that, you know, she didn't get this education she needed. She wasn't helped by a lot of the people around her. She suffered because of the church she was in, purity culture, insufficient homeschooling, and I think it makes her a lot more understandable. I do empathise with her a lot more. Like I say, things like her misogyny, racism, homophobia, transphobia, that's never going to be excusable, but I think they are more explainable now. And on top of all that, it's clear that for a long time she's just been faking who she really is, and she's been miserable for a very long time. And I think it's really hard to see people suffering like that and not feel sorry for them and not want things to get better for them. So in that respect, it was really nice to see Bethany seem genuinely happy in that last live stream I watched. And I do wish her and Dave all the best for the future. You know, I do hope they continue to be happier and they continue making content that's actually gonna help people as opposed to the harmful, hateful, judgmental stuff she's built her career on until this point. Hopefully, this is a turning point, but we'll see. I'm optimistic, but you never know. Um, and that's where I'm gonna end things today. So thank you so, so much for coming on this journey with me. Thank you for sitting through this probably very long video. Thank you for listening to me. If you're new here, it would be great if you wanna subscribe. I make videos about, um, I do like social commentary stuff. I do book reviews, I do poetry analysis. I do science and history content. There's a whole, whole bunch of fun stuff happening around here. So it'd be great if you want to subscribe. Um, I also have Patreon if you would like to support me over there. Um, even at the just little low $1 tier, you can join our Discord server where I'm trying to be a little bit more active and talk to people a bit more on there to overcome my social anxiety a bit more. Um, there's also things like at the higher tiers, you can get exclusive stickers and prints and fun stuff like that. I have merch available, I have my poetry book available, I have all sorts of stuff uh, that you can go and check out down in the video description. But for now, I'd love to hear your thoughts down in the comments on everything we've spoken about today. But for now, thank you for watching. I appreciate you a lot and I'll see you all again very, very soon.